This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. A very good morning to you. It is three minutes after 10 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. It's Thursday, so although we are set to wade through some tricky territory, some very serious stuff, do remember that the light relief awaits at 12 o'clock today when Mystery Hour will, all being well, be upon us. Not quite sure what we're going to do in the next hour yet, but there is one of those stories that challenges some of my preconceptions, looking at the relationship between youth clubs and crime. Not just crime, but also exam results. Um, I I think it probably demands a little more attention. But there are mornings, and I've told you this before, and you're very kind to me, indulging my sort of um, conniptions and uh, discombobulations on a daily basis. But if I'm in the right mood or the wrong mood, that there are some stories I turn away from, some stories I know I should be talking about. And I just can't face the psychic toll some days, you know. It, it's, I, I've told you before, I do envy people who do this for a living, who don't seem to care about anything or anyone except themselves. It must be so liberating to do that um, every morning or afternoon or evening, of course. Um, but I'm not like that. And, and earlier this week, when we turned our attention to the case of Justin Welby, or more, more pertinently, the case of the um, most prolific child abuser that the Church of England had ever sheltered, we, we touched some nerves and we found some common ground together. Uh, we, uh, you were very kind to me when I spoke to you about the guilt I still feel for not having done more as a 12-year-old boy about what we were fairly certain, but never completely certain, was going on at my prep school. And the question that ambushed me slightly because I'm never in case you haven't noticed (laughs) I'm never entirely sure what's going to come out of my cake hole at four minutes three minutes after 10 in the morning I have a I have a broad idea of where the conversation is going to take us but I I don't have any um I don't have any scripts or notes god forbid or, or or running orders or anything like that and so when we got to the line when I found myself saying the line why do the adults stay silent? I got a little bit ambushed by that. It, it kind of smacked me around the back of the head a bit, metaphorically speaking, because it, I, I, I suddenly felt 12 years old again. And the idea that I could have done more seemed suddenly ridiculous in the context of the adults who stayed silent. And that is, of course, um, what Justin Welby stood accused of. His case a little more nuanced, perhaps, than some of the coverage would allow if, if you read the report closely uh, they could have mounted a defense i think with the right advice he could actually have for want of a better phrase he could have styled it out i'm told by people who know such things that that was indeed the plan but it was very much welby's conscience that compelled him to resign um uh, seeing the damage that was being done to the church and also i think feeling shame genuine shame uh, uh uh, his own conduct in the past, or, or, albeit that it may not have been enough in a, in a kind of objective algorithm of public malfeasance to prompt his resignation. Um, uh, uh, and, and yet he has gone, and it was right for him to go. And nobody feels that more keenly than the victims of his abuser, some of whom have found the courage, that, uh, the, the victims of the abuser at the centre of this story, some of whom have found the courage to tell their stories. His name, of course, was John Smythe. And I suggested to you, I think, yesterday, after we'd had time to process news of his resignation, that it wasn't going to end here. And and, and you have to choose your words so carefully on stuff like this. that You have to choose your words so uh, carefully. Even offering up warmish words of support for Justin Well, using the word conscience in the context of this conversation could upset someone. Uh, you know the world we live in now. It's got a little bit better. It, 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 I have to tell you, if you put a little bit of distance between yourself and Twitter, uh, I don't know how long it's going to last, this brave new world on Blue Sky, but people who aren't offended but insist that they are because they think it might hurt the person that they're claiming to be offended by. It's very difficult sometimes to shut out that noise. So someone says, this is so insensitive. And you think, I'm pretty sure it isn't. But it's such fraught territory that any 
claim. It's not any claim that it is. It, 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 again, back to being envious of people who don't care about anything or anyone. You, you want to be completely clear that you're not upsetting people in this kind of space. I've told you a million times, I don't like causing unintentional offence, but I remain a huge fan of causing a intentional offence. So I told you that this wasn't going to end here, and I wasn't sure why. It was, it was, I wasn't sure why I was just a little bit troubled by it. And I'm still not sure why. Because I don't know the answer to this question, because I was not a victim of the sort of abuses that have been dragged back into the spotlight by the case of John Smythe and the failure of the outgoing Archbishop of Canterbury to do everything within his power to ensure that John Smythe faced justice. Um, they, they've now identified four more dignitaries, um, five perhaps actually, who, who have questions to answer according to some of the newspaper coverage. And they will be people who were informed of abuse allegations and did not do enough opportunities were missed to use the language of the review in the case of um, uh, the then Bishop of Ely opportunities were missed to formally report concerns to the police he Stephen Conway as his name was in a potentially powerful position to make sure that the full extent of the concerns was being fully pursued but under his leadership opportunities were missed um, uh, there are five people identified. There will be hundreds more, potentially, such was the prolific nature of the abuse. There will have been hundreds more. There would have been people um, uh, on the same evangelical Christian camps who, who just suspected. But we talked about that on Monday, the ability to turn it off. The idea, Yeah, you see, this is a good example from Francis. I, I probably shouldn't have said courage. I shouldn't have said some of the victims have found the courage to come forward and tell their stories because that suggests that people who can't come forward or don't want to come forward to tell their story, somehow lack courage. You see what I mean about being envious of people who don't care? <laughs> because if you go too far down this route, you can tie yourself in all sorts of knots. But yeah, I think you make a valid point, Francis. You could be too traumatised to talk about it. It doesn't make you whatever the opposite of courage is. But I'm going to ask people to talk about it today, because this is what I want to know. This is what I want to know. How important is it? How much does it help? How much, this is the real killer question, and I think you might need to prepare yourself for it. How angry do you feel towards the people who didn't abuse you, but who you think probably knew that it was happening? 03456060973 is the number that you need. I've never had this conversation, even with the lads that, it happened to at my school. There was a one conversation about our former headmaster who's dead now, so it doesn't matter, but there was a sense, because there were two quite prolific child abusers at my prep school, and, and I don't know how much you know about those kind of schools that are, that are literally owned by the headmaster. Could you imagine the authority that you enjoy in that kind of scenario? He wasn't the abuser himself, but it was so well known and, and, um, and even commented upon that we were... I remember having a conversation about whether it was in any way feasible that, that, that he wouldn't have known. He used to spy on us. Um, uh, I, I, he had his, and this is going to sound perverted anyway, but it's, it's the truth. He had his carpentry workshop in a cellar adjacent to our showers. And he used to, I, I presume, spy um, just on our conversations. He'd listen into our conversations because there were times we thought he was psychic. It happened at my public school as well. The monk who was my housemaster at public school actually told me once because he'd lost his temper and said something that he shouldn't have said out loud. He told me that he used to listen to my phone calls home because his lavatory was in the room next to the telephone booth in our boarding house. He'd, he'd, he'd listen to my phone calls home and, and use things that I'd told my mum and dad against me um, uh, the next time I got into trouble. But, but the headmaster I'm talking about was a, a couple of times he, he blew his cover because it was funny. So I remember we were in the showers after a Scottish dancing class, the bedtime, bath time shower. And it, I, one of us said something like, oh, it, it, another reason why you should join this society is because it gets you in his good books. It gets you in the headmaster's good books. And so he opened the door of his 
um, carpentry workshop. It's, you have to picture like a wine cellar. Do you, do you see what I mean? With arches everywhere. And one of them led into his home and there was a wine. And he opened the door of his uh, carpentry workshop and said, oh, no, it doesn't. And we th all thought that was hilarious. We all thought that was absolutely hilarious. But if he was eavesdropping on us then, he must have been eavesdropping on us when we were talking about what we thought was going on in the photography darkroom or what we thought was going on after lights out in some of the dormitories. But I don't know. I mean, you can imagine a moment in the boots, in the shoes of these boys, or girls. I, my experience is, is, is exclusively boys, these, these survivors. And you can imagine just, I think, the level of fury you feel towards the abuser. But how do you feel towards the adults who stayed silent? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three, and therefore the question that informs all of this really is how helpful is it when they face consequences? So, if, for example, you were a victim of John Smythe, how does the resignation of Justin Welby make you feel? Does it help? That's all I want to know, actually. That does it help, and therefore would it help if? Canon Andrew Corns, the Reverend Stephen Conway, the Reverend Dr. Joe Bailey Wells, the Reverend Hugh Palmer, and the Reverend Sue Coleman, identified today by the Daily Mail as five senior clerics who have quotes questions to answer. End quotes. W would it help if they if they went as well? Um, you do. I've told you before. You keep me honest. I, I love the fact that we can be having this potentially very harrowing conversation, and half a dozen of you are already. Uh, Desperate to find out more about the Scottish dancing classes that I attended as a 12-year-old. But light and shade, eh? All human life is here. We'll, we'll focus on this, all right? And I wonder, I wonder where the parents will contribute as well. When you found out that your child had been a victim of this sort of thing, the anger that you must have felt to the adults you thought would look after them, in, in addition to the adults who... Uh, committing the abuse you know we, we use a phrase in loco parentis in the place of parents it's particularly pertinent in boarding schools particularly pertinent at religious boarding schools i suppose particularly pertinent at schools where they teach latin so does it help that's all i want to know i haven't got i haven't got an angle i, I think it probably must but i don't know how do you feel towards the adults who stayed silent or didn't ask enough questions, who allowed themselves just enough space to not know. Do you see what I mean? Just enough space to know. All they would have needed to do was turn up the light a little bit, or turn up the volume a little bit, and they wouldn't have been able to kid themselves that they didn't know. But they didn't do it. They didn't know. 03456060973 is the number that you need. It's 16 minutes after 10, and, and, and mums and dads, welcome too today. How, how do you feel towards, not the adults who did it, because I think we can all work that out, but the adults who didn't stop it. It's 10, 16. James O'Brien on LBC. 10, 18 is the time. Um, good morning, James. I had a flashback last night about the abuse I received as a young boy. My wife woke me because I was shouting out in my sleep. I woke up so frightened that my wife had to come to the toilet with me. I'm 54, and yes, I'm incredibly angry. I think I might have to tune out for the next hour or so for my own mental health. I need to look after myself. Go carefully. Um, go carefully, Andrew. And, and this, I hadn't thought of this angle as well, but you've suddenly reminded me of something I'll, I'll share in a moment from uh, Luby. Gosh, you really got me with that question, James. My parents knew my abuser. He was a family friend. They knew something was going on, but not the full extent. And they chose, chose is the word, to ignore things, focusing instead on their own tumultuous and often violent relationship. I felt very angry for a long time that no one seemed to care enough to stop it, if I'm honest. I still feel a bit angry. However, I have learned to forgive my parents. I had to accept that it happened and accept their apology. They've said in hindsight that they would have done things differently, so I guess that's enough. But I had to let go of that anger before it ate me up whole. And 20 minutes after 10 is the time. I, I, I remember when we first started dipping our toes into this territory, not, not long after I got that phone call I told you about on Monday from West Midlands Police about teachers at one of my earlier schools. And 
the f I think one of the things that shocked me most, and this happened on a few occasions, was when we were talking about clerical abuse, about priests abusing children. And we were focusing more on the Catholic Church then because more was known about the Catholic Church. The number of people who told me that when they told their mum what the priest was doing, their mum attacked them. When they told their mum what the priest was doing, their mum got cross with them. I don't think you have to be psychic to work out how you might feel towards the people who stayed silent in that space if, if you've actually found the um, uh, uh, whatever it is that you need to tell someone and that person, the person who is supposed to love you more than anyone, let you down your parents didn't believe you or your parents chose not to believe you because of the authority imbued in the figure of the parish priest that's a, a really extreme example. And I, I was reminded of it partly by Luby's message and partly by um, this message here. No name, please, James. I know someone whose mum said, if it turns you gay, I'll kick you out. And he's dead now, so just forget it. See, it's, nah, it doesn't stop with the abuser, does it? 21 minutes after 10 is the time. Josephine is in, is in Watford. Josephine, what would you like to say? Gosh, I'd like to say a lot. Um, well, take just take all in, the time you want, all the time in, you want. <laughs> In the, just to put it in the picture, I saw a teacher abusing an 11-year-old child. Um, I reported it. The other women that saw it all had their own reasons for not reporting it. The school then tried to silence me with threats, such as, in writing, mm. if you report this man again, your own child will be removed from the school without notice. Uh, how long ago was they, this? This was in 2014. Gosh, Okay. Um, it then, because no one else, everyone knew about this man, but nobody reported him. And the reasons that some women gave, one woman gave me this reason why she wasn't going to report him. She said, oh, you don't understand. She said, if I reported everything I've seen him do, he might go to prison for a very long time. And, and this woman, actually, her own child is one of the victims. But anyway, that's, um, so getting... To the point, I, they all had their excuses. One person, her excuse was, no, we should just forgive him, forgive him, forgive him. And someone else I, was, oh, well, I've only got a, a child of the other sex, so it doesn't affect that child because he's only into was that. It, I, could, I mean, what? <clears throat> I've got so many questions, and, and everybody listening will have as well, but it's your story to tell. Was it, was it, a, was it a normal context, a normal community that you were in? Was it religious? Was, I mean, I mean that, that, to imbue uh, this figure with this level of... Authority seems a little bit out of the ordinary. Well, the thing, one of the, so this took at least ten year, five, five to ten years of my life. Yes. Um, but um, <clears throat> the, uh, the thing that was, ident one of the things that was identified, and we've actually been praised by the Children's Commissioner, okay. was that schools were presumed, are always presumed, or were presumed to be honest and presumed to want safeguarding of children. Yes. And when you have a, headmaster who is a paedophile then that is not the case no so that's and the other thing about it is um is that what people mostly do and this is why i would encourage anyone to please report what mostly people do they look at one piece of a puzzle they've seen one thing and they're looking at a piece of a puzzle saying i can't see a picture what they need to do is report the thing they have seen and then let the experts put the picture together, the puzzle together. So if everyone reports what they have seen, then the, the experts can put that puzzle That's together. That's interesting. That's the, the, the yeah, I understand picture. what you're saying because it spares you the, 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 the sense of powerlessness. That, that This is such a huge thing to tackle yeah. i can't do it on my own but but you don't need to do it on your own you just need to be one, one, one part of a of a much bigger project so you took your complaint to the authorities well i went outside of the school the school yes. ended up being shot down the teacher was banned for life but um yes but even out the grooming had gone as far as the authorities so what the school did um they knowingly um Try to so I really became I, I know that now I didn't know it at the time yes. but a whistleblower so yes. what they do to whistleblowers is exactly what they'll do so they try to suggest that I had some sort of you know I don't know some sort of um, grudge or mental health I don't, problems grudge or, or something or, yes. which they suggested she that can't be trusted. They, no, she can't be trusted. they had no evidence 
of that and there was no reason for me to even have that and in fact there was evidence of the opposite because actually I would consider myself was a gr- I was a groomed parent okay as well but, but, but of course I, in I those just, sort of contexts the parents have been groomed as well as the children because the oh absolutely the man gets access to the to the sort of family space which is where the really oh, terrible yes. stuff can happen what, what do you feel now and I appreciate that you were groomed but but happily you weren't a, a victim of actual child sex abuse, and nor nor was your child. No. How do you no. feel towards those women who 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 even went so far as to articulate the reasons behind their inactivity, their inaction? Well, um, <clears throat> the one that said she was afraid that he'd go to prison for a very long time. Yes. Um, she, her own child, is actually in fact one of the victims. Okay. Um, and when she said that to me, I said to her, "So, do you care about him Gosh. more than you care about children?" And she has never spoken to me again since I asked her that question. Do you care about him more than you care about your own child? Or any child. I mean, I didn't even specify her child at the time. I didn't even know, I think, that her child was one of the victims. Oh, I see. That came so out later. at the time, I just said, that's another thing. A lie, I am sadly feel I now understand how the Holocaust happened because a lot of people don't care if it's not their child or don't care if it's not well, them. That's, that's part, Pastor Martin Niemöller's poem, isn't it? That that famous poem about first they came for a section of society I wasn't in and I did nothing because I wasn't affected. It wasn't me. And then they came for, yeah. the, the, you know, then they came for the for the Roma and then they came for the homosexuals and then they came for the trade. So you but, feel, uh, but, but, but of course she wasn't aware that, that her own child was there. And, and, what about the idea of consequences for other people in the school who must have known? I mean, I don't know that... Don't there know. are none, and some of them are still working in other schools. And this has got to stop because they have, uh, you know, they, they, they have failed to report things. And it is that thing. People think that they have to make a decision or they have to make a judgment, and you don't. So you're, when you're, you report a great, things... Yeah, exactly that. I don't have to do anything else except tell people no. what I what I know the, or what I think I know. It's the fa- no, it's not even what you think you know. It's literally the facts of exactly yeah. what you saw. You do not need to make any judgments or any assessments of whether it really was this or wasn't that. Or Just hand over the facts to the experts and they will decide whether it's abuse or not or whether it's a nothing they will put the pieces of the puzzle together and they will decide if it's all okay or not you do not have to decide that before you report it yeah you've been on quite a journey haven't you absolutely more than i can tell actually well i'm sure uh, (laughs) i can tell that that you're leaving some things unsaid and and thank you uh, on on both levels thank you for for the call but thank you also for for what you did and for the rest of us we're left wondering what's the difference between josephine and those other mums Uh, and what is the difference what what is it and if you thought i was exaggerating about the parents turning on the child sometimes then uh I can assure you, I'm getting plenty of evidence in my inbox that that is not that that, that is a, a a commonplace experience. My grandfather did that to my uncle, for example. He told her what the priest had done to him, and she beat him for talking about the priest like that. So, yeah. And we started off saying, how do you feel about the adults who stayed silent? But but there are adults who've done worse than stay silent. There are adults who've compounded the abuse by attacking the abu- the, the abused. Because of what Josephine touched on, because of this, I mean, that that character, that headmaster, when she talks about the family being groomed, he'd have been really charismatic. He'd have been somebody that everybody wanted to be in with. He'd have be, been somebody who, you know, you wanted to, to, to feel favoured by. You wanted to have him round to your house for dinner. You wanted to feel that you were... Um, being being touched by the aura by some people are like that a lot of abusers are like that it's a it's a great facilitator of abuse but that was so helpful that line you don't have to decide katie says thank you so much for airing these callers josephine was brilliant um a salve to monday's show again monday's show of course left some question marks hanging about what people could have done instead but you don't have to decide you don't have to decide you you go to the authorities you tell them what you know and that's it and that's why everyone should look up mandatory reporting and find out more about what mandatory reporting involves seriously because it is absolutely intrinsic to this conversation and and to this whole phenomenon it is half past 10 on the on the on the dot and thomas watts is here with your headlines james o'brien on lbc 
7.32 is the time. This from Monica caught my eye. I lived in Zimbabwe and I knew John Smythe. My son went on two of his camps, but fortunately was not abused. It is so true what James is saying, that the perpetrator is charismatic and charming. He was both of these things. I, I, I think there's a real danger of thinking that they're all like the child catcher in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Do, do you know what I mean? That, 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 that could not be further from the truth. The one at my prep school was, was the cool teacher. The one that the mums fancied, you know? The one that the boys wanted to be like. And he, he, he chose the football team. He chose the rugby team. Everybody wanted to be in with him. He wasn't like the, the, the creepy weirdo in the corner of the common room. I am so grateful that Smythe was exposed in Zimbabwe by parents and subsequently left for South Africa. But I'm obviously sad, so sad that he then continued his abuse there and got away with it. So as, as is natural and inevitable, this conversation has gone off in, in, in different directions. But it, the, the, the central starting point remains. Does it help if the ones who stayed silent get punished? Some of the bishops that haven't resigned already if they end up going, will have been dragged kicking and screaming to the point of resignation. So they won't have done it from their conscience. I think Welby did. You can disagree, all right? And, and uh, you know, uh, there's probably not a 100% um, answer to that question. But, but now that the story continues to move and more names are added into the mix, these are people who know what they did and who know what they knew and have not yet resigned. So if they do, it will be under enormous pressure. Would that help? Would it feel like a punishment? Do you want them to be punished? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Uh Demis is in Edinburgh. Demis, what would you like to say? Oh hi James. Hi. Um just, I wanna thank you for bringing light to all this. It's really personal to me. I'm I'm a survivor myself I'm in sorry. my late forties. Yeah, it's okay. Um I, I come from a background of I had a piano teacher grooming situation for several years. Um it was it was pretty rough. Yeah. Um um, but it was one of those things. My parents got me out of there, and um, I've been dealing with it ever since. But what's why I'm calling? Um, it's just about this sort of silence aspect of things. I, one of the things I did in my forties to process everything was an art project I sat with, um, you know, forty or fifty different survivors and heard their stories. And Gosh. that silence is quite. It's just quite common at different different levels, and um, it, it's not just structural silence. It's how, how do you react even within a family when it's dad and mum's been told? And it's um, I, I found the whole thing, yeah, it's it, it's really difficult to to know yeah. where to, when to be angry and when yes when to be accepting. And I, I'm not justifying at all the terrible things that have happened, particularly structurally. I think uh, institutions should be held accountable 100. Um, percent But once it gets down to the the, the people. Um, in the smaller situations, um, yeah, it's really um, it's really delicate sometimes, and there's a nuance. Um, I'm so glad you're saying that. I, I'm not in a position to say that, but 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 you are because sometimes that, that, that that's why what Josephine said was so powerful. You, you don't mm. you know the idea that you don't have to take it all onto your own shoulders all you have to do mm. is tell the authorities the one thing you know and they will do the rest that didn't yeah. used to be true quite yeah. the opposite but i do believe that it is now true i do believe that the, the i mean almost every story we've heard this week involves praise for the authorities once they were alerted but the yeah. people who didn't alert them will be understandable sometimes yeah yeah, and and it depends when as well. There's there were times, w with, even within my own story, um, when I finally went to the police on my own accord. My parents didn't do; they took me away, but there was no prosecution. You know, I I was always angry about that. Were you? Um, have you spoken to yeah, them about it? Yeah, I have. And, and they the, say the thing, to, the thing to thing to thing I realised was at the time when I did take it to the cops, they said, "Oh, what station was that? And when was this? this is the nineties. Yeah. And they said, Oh mate, they would have laughed you out of there. There was yeah. no support for men, boys. They would have just made a derogatory comment about the fact that this was a male abuser and, um, you know, called me a, a dirty word, yeah. uh, as I walked out the door and there and was your not parents really knew that. support. Your parents knew that probably. I think they did the best they could do yeah. at the time. Oh, I think oh, we're, mate, we're past so that now. Yes. No, it's, 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 I got what I, well, I got the best that I could to the time. It's just, I think it's really difficult to, to go back. Once you're going back a few decades, I think we have moved on 
in some ways, and, and that, it's nice to see the light shine on and, and it, it is. accountability coming out. Yeah, I, I mean, it is to see the improvement, but I wonder whether that actually provides some context, and, and I know this is your mm. intention for the broader conversation, in that we're kind of, there is a slight danger, and again, I'm, I, mm. I can only say this in a conversation with you, I wouldn't go out solo and make this point, but there's a slight danger of, of holding people to account holding people to the standards that we have happily achieved now, but were simply not in place then. And, mm. and, and you need to understand their behaviour in the context of what you've just said about how the cops would yeah. have responded to the complaint. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not in any way excusing what you know. happened to me, and, and I'm not in any way um, wanting to cast uh, a bad light on the authorities. They, they did me right when I did come, come forward. Um, Good. And they, they did try to prosecute this guy. Unfortunately, he died uh, just before they went to arrest him. Wow. And I miss I missed my justice. But yeah. uh, what it what it did what it did do was make me respect how far things have actually come. And the silence is the worst part. The yeah. the, the not coming forward with the story is so much worse than coming forward and you know not maybe if you don't get what you would think was perfect support, you know. That's still not not a reason not to come forward. Um, yeah. I think you just got to get it out. Just just got to get it out. It's why the, there was such a, a move, sort of ten f- years ago, to 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 get that message out into the ether that you will be believed, telling survivors mm-hmm. that you will be believed, and um and and some people struggle to understand why that was so important. But that's, yeah. a, that's a huge part of, of of the process of coming forward. But, one, one thing, though, is the, the only thing that I think what, it's it's a really difficult one um, is what something I picked up from talking to these other survivors was how often internally in a family um, one might be asked to keep quiet and it just for some other, you know, tricky reason of reputation or uh, relationship or something like that. And it's 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 really difficult. It's it, it can be very hard for people to to actually do the right thing for yeah. the people that they're in that they're in charge of supporting um uh, they, people don't know how to handle this stuff when it's put on their lap even if they're not the one who's been abused yeah. and um it's not always it's not always the the failure outside sometimes there's a failure inside the support system and and it's just people trying to do their best you know there's nothing you're a very generous no man you're a very generous man were well, you always like that uh, no, but I've, I've really had to work on acceptance, but it's, it's all horrible, man. <laughs> I, I know, I know. But, if, but, you, if you can, yeah, I'm really angry at institutions, though. I think yes. if, if institutions need to do the right thing. And, 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 of course, they don't for the reasons we were discussing on Monday about self-protection and, and reputational damage. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, you're a great advertisement, if, if you don't mind me saying so, for the importance of doing the work and the, and the, and the power. It gives you power, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, particularly as as a man, um, it, we're not meant to talk about this stuff traditionally. And I think it's really important that we all do. Um, it doesn't matter how old you are, just talk exactly about that. it. It's, no, you're you're, yeah. you're exactly right. And, and and as ever on days like today, my, my inbox uh, 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 groans under the weight of people who are, are ready to share some of what has happened to them, but are not yet ready to, to talk about it for, for, for obvious reasons. And that, that, that question of silence is intrinsic to where the Church of England story is going. Silence or inaction. And I, I, Demis, take care, mate. Thank you. Uh, I, I mentioned on Monday that call we took, and I just want to revisit it briefly from uh, Margaret in Catterick, who discovered images of child sexual abuse on her husband's computer while she was... Um, I, 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 something about this little vignette that, that breaks the story open in a way. She, she was trying to print out menus for the dinner party they were throwing that evening. And she happened upon images of child sex abuse. And, and she did that little processing moment of not knowing what the hell she was looking at and then realised and then closed the computer and immediately phoned the police. And I used the phrase, and she blew her whole life up. And I stand by that phrase because it helps to understand why some people might have pretended that they hadn't seen what they've seen. They might have thought, well, I, I, I'd have to lose the house. I'll, I'll be, uh, everyone in the village will know. I'll be, uh, the story will be in the local paper, depending on how big a deal he is, it might be in the national news. So I'm not going to do that. I get that. But of course, for huge numbers of people, you would not be blowing your own life up by reporting what a teacher has done or what you think is going on. You would not be blowing your own life up. Part of Demise's parents' motivation would have been, I think, 
not wanting him to be in the witness box. Talking, I'm, I mean, a, a good impulse, a healthy, protective parental impulse, but all part of the equation that appears when you ask the question of why these people get away with it for so long and why good people, and I'm sticking with that, you might not like it, but I, why good people stay silent. Sarah's in all the shots. Sarah, what would you like to say? Yeah, um, okay, I feel a bit nervous. I, um, it's only me, it's, Sarah. I know that, but <laughs> it's, it happened so many years ago with my son, okay. who was, I mean, with, they were both altar boys, but we had, had entertaining priests in the house. Priest, yep. um, the kids were all upstairs with other children. They were asked to get out of the bedroom, and the priest said, just for this, my son, just to remain in. Anyway, the next morning, I was reading my paper in my bed, and the son, I heard boys fighting, and one was called another one gay, etc., Cut long story short, the priest had asked my son to sit on his knee while he was kissing him and stroking his back, and he, he felt awful about it. Okay. I did. I was so shocked. I actually, and it, I was to your other callers, I actually feel the shame and guilt. Why? Because, because I, I, how could I not have seen all this happening? I was actually afraid to go downstairs to say to my husband. So I called my friend, who was brilliant, and she just said to me, I need to, they're doing a job like everyone else, he's done this. You know, it, this is wrong what you have done. But um, so eventually I reported it. It oh. was recognised. He was still practising the priest <clears throat> for six months after this occasion. I took my children off the altar. But That's a big deal for a Catholic mum. It was, it, it was, it was, the thing is, what I was trying to, I was actually ashamed. I yeah. didn't speak about it to anyone apart oh, from my friends. I was too afraid. I was too afraid because I hadn't seen what was coming. Now, when I think of it, he actually took my son out for dinner. I thought there was nothing wrong with that. No. And he used to say to him, oh, um, you know, you have to come up to Presbyterian and see how a priest works over the weekend. Yeah. So when I think of it, <clears throat> I did not recognise this at all. This is where my guilt's coming from. And anyway, six months later, the priest was removed. And the, the deacon had said the priest has got his ill. I went to the, the, the priest who was visiting to say, can you just tell me, was this sexual abuse? And he said yes. From that day on, <clears throat> I was able to talk about it. Right. And I remember visiting priests coming to the presbytery many months later, and I was there, and they said, oh, do your children go to the church? And in a loud voice, so that everyone could hear me in the room, I said, as a result, the fact that my child was sexually abused in this place, obviously not. And everyone was shaken by it. So yes. I was able to talk about it. Gosh. But honestly, when, when I think of it now, and imagine me allowing him to go for a meal with my son, but 100% I did not, yeah, but, 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 we but, didn't think anything but no, about but it. But there's no, you, you had no reason to, 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 to think anything bad was going on. This is, the, this is what society, the authority that society gives to the priest. There's nothing to do with you. You know, I, 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 I you put them on pedestals, which is yes. ridiculous. Well, that's Absolutely. how that's how they get away with it because we. Put, <laughs> exactly. they, it's not. I mean, yeah. we, in the broadest possible sense, put them on pedestals. Two thousand years of tradition puts them on pedestals. It's Absolutely. not. It's not. It's not your fault. I know, but I felt it, and yeah. I feel how could I have been so stupid? And I, and I, to this day, I still think. But fortunately, we can laugh about it now. Can and you? the boys and my daughter, we all we all joke about this piece. He's dead. Um, <laughs> but so I think the fact that we speak about it, um, and because well, it, it does happened. sound. It, please, it, it does sound as if you, you it was nipped in the bud in the case of your boy, but with other boys, probably it wasn't. Yeah, I mean, I think your callers have been absolutely brilliant, especially Josephine. I just loved it um, here, which was true. <laughs> You've been pretty good um, yourself, actually. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's because I'm going out, actually. Anyway. Um, How do you uh, feel now? I feel it's just brought everything up with, yes. with the priest. And I can't believe that's over 30 years. No, but it's, it's yesterday. I, it's yesterday. I know, and I can't even believe that it, it's... <clears throat> I feel this emotion as if it was as if it was yesterday. But I'm, I'm fine, actually. I'm, I, I'm, I sat fine. here on Monday, and I, I, I felt I was 12 years old again. Is that incredible, isn't it? Yeah, mm -hmm. it, I mean, and that is, and, and, and neither of us are victims. So God knows if, if that's how, it, if that's the effect it has on us, the effect that it has on, 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 on the children who were uh, survivors. I prefer survivors. I, again, I talked to you earlier about the importance of language in these cases, and then I apologise for any mistakes that I've made. Um, Thank you, Sarah. That was incredible, wasn't it? And and that phrase, pedestal, of course, absolutely crucial 
to the whole process that we're describing. And, and I want you to remember that point I made. This is a journey of discovery for me as well about about the child catcher in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. It depends on your age, probably, but you think, oh, Miss Trunchbull in, in Matilda, the, 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 the character in fiction that you most obviously associate with childhood fear or childhood trauma, the character created to terrify you, or to, uh, and, and it's not like that. John Smythe, I, I can almost guarantee, would have been the life and soul of the party, um, and, and that is absolutely crucial to the process and crucial to understanding the silence that we're discussing today. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 10 to 11. Um, uh, good to see more and more people migrating towards Blue Sky, um, a, a newish social media platform that I am certainly finding a lot more um, uh, pleasant these days than the one that Elon Musk owns. Um, and, and, and this subject uh, prompting some of you to get in touch. Uh, this is, Duncan, you touch on something a lot of people will recognise who went to these kinds of schools. At my boarding school, we weren't allowed to send sealed letters home. When you were giving the letter in to be sent, you weren't allowed to seal it. He said, I always wondered why that was, but given today's conversation and some other things I've heard since, I think I know now. Good Lord. Um, this must try harder says uh, are these the same people who turned their eyes away in 30s germany i would have said no but josephine raised the point very powerfully and and in a sense yes this is a conversation says adam on blue sky that nobody wants to have but it is a conversation that we absolutely must have and i i, I think that scm speaks for quite a few people who, who suggest if they knew as opposed to just suspected and didn't act then yes they share culpability in my view victims not being believed is why abuse is so rampant the only deterrent appears to be significant consequences um i, I wonder whether some people find it extraordinary that we're even having a conversation about members of a church knowing about abuse and not doing everything within their power to bring the abuser to justice and asking whether or not they should be punished as well I, I, you know, we all get groomed by our environments and our upbringings. You know, I, I, th th some of the monks that went to jail from my school, one of them was one of my favorite teachers. Again, happily, I, I, I was never targeted. I don't think I was. I, I, I was certainly never abused. But whether I was targeted or not, I'm not 100% sure. But he was one of my favorite teachers. And the, and the abuser at my prep school was, was everybody's favorite teacher. So... You know, that, that idea of um, I, I, I'd staying silent is a lot more complicated than first cursory glances allow. But I mention that because if, if, you, if you were just fully formed intellectually, but you had no knowledge or experience or memory, and someone said, there's this thing, right? It's a church. It teaches other people how to behave. It, it, it's a force for good, ostensibly. It's, it's run by humans, so it's fallible, but it is a moral crusade. Uh, made flesh. Oh, and some of some some of the very very senior people in it didn't do anything when they found out that children were being sexually abused by one of their own. What should happen to them? You're having a debate about what should happen to them. You're having a conversation about whether or not they should face consequences, whether or not they should resign, whether or not this is me criticizing myself. Good people can do bad things. You're having a debate about this. That's gaslit nation territory, I think. Tyler is in Deptford. Tyler, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, thanks for taking my call. You're very well. Um, when I was uh, a kid, I was in a scout group, um, and one of the masters would regularly abuse me over the course of a few years. And um, at the time, I was so frightened to tell anyone. I ended up calling Childline. Oh, wow. Um, which, which were great. Um, but the thing that struck me sort of when it all came out is how divided it made the community because the guy that did it uh, was really well known um, locally. He worked with a lot of charities, lots of children's charities, funnily enough. Um, and even though they found sort of evidence and they found um, abuse material on his computer, the community was divided between people that believed me and people that didn't. Um, and did it all come on? Come down on you? It, 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 there weren't other people involved. Was it? Was it your word against his? Um, kind of. Some more. Some more kids came forward afterwards. Right. But I was kind of the figurehead for the whole thing. Yes. I sort of ended up being bullied at school oh, because sorry. of oh, things that like oh. parents would tell their kids about me. Yeah. I had. Um, I was an actor at the time. I wanted to be an actor. Yeah. So that was sort of used against me. 
because of my ability to tell stories and make things up. Oh, I see. Um, how did yeah, it? How did it? I mean, how did it roll out? How did what transpired? How did it develop? Um, it went to court, and he was convicted. Um, oh. he's been did that change anything times since. in the way you were treated? Not really. Weirdly, um, it, I ended up having weird, to leave the area. It, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I, because people would rather attack you than confront the hideous reality. I'm not making excuses for them by any no, stretch of the imagination, but it would perhaps, for a certain type of personality, it would be easier to kick out at you than it would be to confront that hideous truth. I just truth. think they couldn't possibly believe that they'd yeah. made a mistake about this guy. Yeah. Um, yes, I guess that's tough to come to terms with. When and, and how are you doing now? Of, how are you doing now? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm sort of in and out of therapy Good. with it. Good. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I think about it a lot, but it's getting better as time goes on. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. You deserve you deserve it all, all the good stuff. Do you want to tell me how you feel about the people who, who kind of, in a slightly different category, who you think did believe you but didn't do anything about it? Um, I mean, or I not. think there are a lot of those, to be honest, yeah. um, in, in, the, in the same group. I don't really know how I feel about them. Okay. To be honest. Good. No, I, I respect that, and and, and I, I don't want to open up any wounds that you're not ready to deal with yet. But um, but but you know, we say it on this program sometimes in quite a throwaway kind of way. But I, I really cannot stress enough how good good how good good therapy can be. There's two goods in that sentence deliberately. How good good therapy can be. It's coming up to ten fifty seven. Um, Sarah's in Chippenham. Sarah, what would you like to say? Oh hi. Um, Hello. I just wondered why these bishops and why um, Jess and Welby was allowed to make the choice of resigning. Gosh. Well, why were they not? Why are they not being removed? They are surely compliant if they know that this has been going on. Uh, I mean, the amount of boys that would have been saved from having this happen to them if these people had been up front from the beginning. Well, the, um, I mean, there are. There I mean, are a... Will you go back and Sorry, look at? at what happened with Jimmy Savile and yes. the amount of people that kind of knew what he was doing. If they'd said so at that time, so many people would not have gone through what they did from him. Yes, I, I think it's easy from the out, sometimes a bit easier from the outside than it, than it is from the inside. And, and the effort that these men put into creating the, their own personal mythologies is, is immense. But yeah, the, the, your first question about resignation, I suppose, is partly due to the fact that the world was different then from what it is now. So well, I mean, I was I was re brought up uh, in in a Catholic home. Right. I went to a school, a primary school that was run by nuns. Yes. Um, and it was awful. I mean, the headmistress there was a nun, and she was she'd be in jail now. She was sadistic. She would, you know, slap you on the back bare backside with a wooden ruler, and I would have been about eight then. Yeah. And and I think. Even now, at 58, I think about that, and it makes me want to cry. I listen to this stuff with Ju Justin Welby, yeah. and even now it makes me want to cry. And I wasn't uh, by any means sexually abused like that, but it just it oh, just it was horrifies it was me trauma. that people are still... My parents knew, and right. they have, they have apologised since, but my mum thought, because she was brought up as Catholic particularly, uh, staunch Catholic, and I think... So many people, like you said before, put all of these priests and things on pedestals mm. and think that they can't do anything wrong. I, I would not. I have four grandchildren now. I would not leave any one of them alone in a room with a priest. No. Not. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even you, contemplate. It just, it horrifies me that these stories are still coming out but You've now. covered so much and, ground. You, because the, the, the other thing that occurs to me is what the nun did to you. The reason why everybody knew about it was because it wasn't considered to be abnormal at the time absolutely well, that's not even absolutely. staying silent I, I, about abuse that is what was not considered abuse when you were a little girl no no and that wasn't just me and oh, I, I know i know i mean i got i got siblings that went to the same school that had some of the same tr same treatment and some of the people at the kids at that school got worse than than what i used of to course. get because i you know and it just it just frightens me when you think now that it's, and it comes back to the church every time when you look at the things that happen and it's and they're people within the church and we've always been as a, as a child I was taught to look up to the church and the priests were right and and it, 
it frightens me now thinking about how much more of this is still going on and people are not not saying about it yeah yeah I, and, and are doing all the things that we've spent an hour talking to incredibly um a, 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 i don't know what word to use sarah do i say brave do i say courageous what's the word you use to describe people who've had had the confidence if that's the right word to call in today and, and share such such important stories but you remind us about the changing nature of normality even but yeah that, that, that question there of giving these people the luxury to resign once the extent of their silence or complicity is clear you, you get newspaper articles about dignitaries who have questions to answer and I, I, Sarah sees it a lot more clearly than perhaps I managed to at 10 o'clock this morning it, there, there, there are no questions to answer you might say you knew you did nothing you go and and but, but you know we're still waiting for you to resign i don't know it's 1101 james o'brien on lbc have you ever read uh, four minutes after 11 is the time um but, uh, yeah don't that's not the end of the question obviously if i need to do a little bit of reading now uh sadiq khan will be with us tomorrow on the program for the first speak to sadiq i think since we got a labor government if, if memory serves if you have a question you would like to put to the mayor of london then call in tomorrow or get your question in early by going to lbc.co.uk slash question coming up later this hour we'll speak to human rights watch about the latest allegations of crimes against humanity in gaza being committed by um uh, uh, the israeli defense force i've got an unhinged headline for you we haven't had one of those for a while um so stay tuned for that and then of course at 12 o'clock it is mystery hour have you ever read an article an opinion piece a first person piece and encountered a first sentence so unutterably relevant to you personally that you feel seen in a way that you have never felt seen before i mean this is the absolute mothership of there's a word for it i've forgotten what it is there's a journalist years ago when i was at school called william leith who i think was the first it was already popular in america but i think he was the first british journalist to just write stuff about the minutiae of his own existence i really like that kind of uh commentary i really like that i don't know why it just tickles me and I, I used to read his stuff was it in the independent on sunday i forget i'm so old um and, and every now and then someone will write something it's a bit like peter Kay's comedy and peter Kay says something and the whole audience goes yes yes i yes garlic bread do you know what i mean those are good comics quite a lot of stuff is just saying, do you remember spangles and for some reason everyone goes yeah yeah i love spangles oh yeah <sighs> But sometimes it's really personal and you know it won't be resonating with everybody. And in fact, you wonder whether it's resonating with anyone except you and the person that wrote it. And that's exactly how I felt this morning when I encountered Adrian Charles's latest column, uh, by far the best value columnist on British newspapers. And this is what he wrote. This is the first sentence. Um, he's been on full disclosure already before. Whenever I big someone up on a programme, I get half a dozen messages saying, hey, you should get him on full disclosure. I go, you should bloody listen to it more because he's been on it already. Um, but this this could not be more about... I think this might be more about me than it is about Adrian Charles. All right, you ready? <clears throat> there are several problems with my face, not least of which is that I look so bloody miserable all the time. Honestly, I'm usually smiling inside. A nice woman stopped me in the street on Sunday to tell me that she never looked very happy either. We were kindred spirits, she said, because she, like me, had a resting, not happy face. So... I, I, I mean, this is the problem with these clips. If the clips had never happened, then obviously, uh, you know, the, the show wouldn't be anywhere near as popular as it is today. But equally, you'd think I was a really chirpy fellow. If the, if the clips had, if the clip, the viral clip had never happened, you'd think if you pictured me in your head and you'd never seen me in the flesh, you'd think, oh, he's a smiley fella. He's like a young Terry Wogan. You'd think to yourself, he's so whimsical, and he's always smiling. He's always so happy, except obviously when he does the sit. Instead, because of these clips, I said that a bit straight to camera. I, I look like a miserable git all the time, e even when I'm happy. You see, I'm, I'm happy now, right? But I bet on camera I look miserable. You could probably do a little thing saying, James O'Brien broken by the news. And I'm actually sitting here going, oh, Peter Kay, garlic bread, isn't it funny? Spangles. That's just my face. It's how my face works. So Adrian has decided to smile more. I'm not sure you're ready for that. I, 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 I'm really not sure you're ready for that. If you're watching on YouTube, I, I, how would you feel if every now and then you just got, got, caught me sort of going like this? That's amazing radio, that is, isn't it? Hey? Eh? Um, 
It'd be like when Wednesday Adams smiles in the in the Adams family films, wouldn't it? It's not quite that bad, Eleanor. Do you mind? Uh, I, I so the minute, and that's the other thing he says. The minute you start thinking about it, everything gets worse. The trouble is that as soon as I start thinking about what to do with my face, I find it I find it even harder to know what to do with it. So I'm now consciously trying to smile more. No, I'll do it for real now. Ready? Okay. It's like I did a book event last night. I had a wonderful time uh, uh, at the exchange in Twickenham. And that reminds me that I have a couple of notes. Um, a, a wonderful little festival, Creative Voices 2024, being put together by Arts Richmond. And uh, there are still some tickets left for Susie Dent's event next week on the 20th of November. So that's next Wednesday. So you can go and see Susie Dent being interviewed at the exchange in Twickenham if you are so minded. And while I'm remembering my to-do list from last night, a big hello to Elizabeth in Weybridge, who I'm told listens to the program very, very closely every single day. So, Elizabeth, thank you so much for that. Um, I, I really do appreciate it. And I hope you're having a great day. Uh, and now I'm happy and smiling and smiling. So now I try and do a smile, but I'm thinking about smiling, which means it will come out like this. So when people say, can I have a selfie? And I go, yeah, of course you can. And they say, is that all right? And you can't say no, take another one. I look ridiculous because there's about 40 people waiting to have their book signed. I said, don't show me the photo is what I say now. And then you post it on social media and I go, how could you have not shown me that photo? I look absolutely ridiculous. I, I, I look deformed in some of them, you know? It's, I, anyway, the trouble is that as soon as I start thinking about what to do with my face, I find it even harder to know what to do about it. But if Adrian Charles can walk down Stourbridge High Street, which is not far from where I grew up, maybe there's something in the water. Maybe there's something in <laughs> Seven Trent Water uh, and smile more than I think I can as well. So that is today's little memo to self. <sighs> You're going to have to watch this one back on YouTube. You can tell when I'm smiling because I sound like this. I sound like Tommy Cooper. Uh, ten minutes after 11. I thought we'd do something a bit different next, and I thought we'd offer it up as an antidote to the last hour. I know there'll be some crossover, and, and I don't want to go anywhere near the crossover. All right? You're just going to have to let me make that decision because this is actually about a very positive influence that adults can have on children's lives. I, I, I was struck by the final call reminding us that she wouldn't let any of her grandchildren stay on her own in the, with, with a priest. And, and I, I, I felt a pang of sadness because there are some great priests, you know, and I've encountered some wonderful priests in my life. The, 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 you know, the priest that I spoke to a lot when my father died was a wonderful, wonderful counsellor. But I completely understand Sarah's point. But I thought, given that the Institute for Fiscal Studies have teed this up for us like an open goal... I thought we'd reflect a little bit on the on the very very positive role that um, uh, 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 adults can play in children's lives because they have reported that if you look at the impact of the closure of youth clubs on children, they focus on London, but this will apply everywhere. In the past decade, so largely, it will be as a consequence of austerity. Um, they found that the average teenager achieved half a grade lower in a GCSE, a full grade lower if they were from a deprived background and became 14% more likely to become involved in criminal activity in the six years after a closure. Do you know that in 2009, shortly before the Tories got in, about 40% of young people in London were attending a youth club at least once a week, free after-school programmes. Um, uh, the, the Labour Party... Uh, uh, or not the Labour Party, but councils up and down the country, whether they're Labour, Conservative or Liberal Democrats, reported in one newspaper today, are, are poised to increase council taxes, which is a wonderful opportunity to have a phone in about how bad the council services are in your area and how that makes you certain that councils don't need more money. I'll just let that one percolate with you for a moment. Give me a ring and tell me about your bin day. And then we can all complain about how bad councils are as a way of proving that councils don't need more money to provide better services. Anyone? Anyone? Any, can anyone join those particular dots together as the Daily Mail is inviting you to do today? Because, uh, of course, youth service provisions, one of the things that goes when council taxes are kept artificially low. And who are the people that it doesn't affect? The people who've got a few quid. I don't need council tax services. I never go to the library. Yeah, OK. But everyone you encounter in your life benefits from public services, whether it's a shop assistant or a doctor. 
you know, right from the from from right across the full gamut of society. Oh, and the police, by the way, they get some of their funding from council tax. So do the fire service. I don't need council services. I, my house will never catch fire. Anyway, I, I digress slightly, but the importance of youth clubs. And I've got to tell you, uh, thank you, Al, this is quite nice. You don't always look miserable, James. Sometimes you look like an excited child. Is that good? I think it's good. And that apparently comes from someone who looks psychotic in every rugby game photo that she has ever appeared in. And Liam's been in touch. This is very important uh, to tell us that bin days are on Thursdays. Uh, thank you. And that's quite a nice picture. Where's that one from? That's from Kevin. Uh, you do, you're right. Um, uh, I do look like you've just signed for Kidder Mr. Harris. That's quite a nice picture. You can put that one on social media if you want. Where's that one from? Manchester. Anyway, tell me about the difference youth clubs made in your life because I've got quite an embarrassing confession to make. When we used to talk about knife crime or when we used to talk about social deprivation or when we used to talk about children being at loose ends and someone would say to me, uh, you, you've got to have more youth clubs, James. I used to, I, I just, I don't, I hope it doesn't come across on the radio. I, I really hope you don't notice. But sometimes I, I, I have a little impulse that kicks in when a caller says something I've heard a million times before, right? And that is a failing of mine. That's a fault on my call, on, on my part. Because if you've said it a million times before, it's almost certainly true. Uh, you know what I get like sometimes on my high horse saying, I want new answers. I want radio phone-ins like no other radio phone-in that's ever gone before. We're talking about knife crime. Tell me something new. Tell me something that has never been said before. But actually, it tempts you into a place where you ignore the bleeding obvious. It tempts you into a place where you don't put in the effort to understand the thing that everybody mentions because you think it's boring or you think it's obvious, but you haven't put any effort at all into understanding why it's important. So people would say to me, they've shut all the youth clubs, and I go, yeah, yeah, but what, what else? Maybe there's not much else. You know, what do you do? You're 15, right? You're 15, you don't want to be at home. I often wonder about how relevant the size of your home is and who else is in it. You know, kids who can find proper refuge in their own bedrooms. I could as a kid. My kids could. You can find proper refuge. You can cut yourself off from the rest of the house. You can have me time. Uh, you can get online, of course, as well. But what, what, you know, what if you can't? What if the, the walls are so thin? What if you share a room? What if you've got bunk beds? What if you hate your stepfather or your stepmother? There's that idea, I don't want to be at home. I want to be out. And I've got a couple of mates. And they're not my best mates. They're not my mates from school. My mates from school are at home. But I'm knocking about with some new people. And um, we've got nowhere to go. Oh, will you shut up about youth clubs? I can't think of anything more middle class than dismissing youth clubs, actually. So you come from, as a commentator, someone who's paid for their opinions, you are lucky enough to be in a place where your children have got after-school clubs. Or your children might even be at boarding school. Your children might be um, playing sport. You can drive them because you're not working night shifts. You can drive them to and from whatever appointments it is that they have. It's the most middle-class snobbery, I think, that uh, I can imagine. And I've got a horrible feeling I was guilty of it. I think that might have been part of the reason behind my impatience. Behind my impatience. So, you tell me what a difference they make, please. 03456060973. Can you look yourself in the eye, do you think, in the mirror? And, and, and actually say, do you know what, James? If it wasn't for youth clubs, I, I think I could have gone rogue. I, 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 you know those paths, those forks in the road that you meet in life. And the mad thing is that when you meet them, you don't notice that they're forks in the road. You don't really look down the other one. You're just running at full speed down the wrong one. You look back and think, why did I do that? Why did I start hanging around with him? Why did I do that thing? Why didn't I do that? Why didn't I go there? What space did youth clubs fill in your life? It's a really important conversation, this, and I think I've only managed to have it in the correct way once before. So, after a youth club closed, there was, there was a little bit of positive. Um, no, there wasn't any positive. They, they, the teenagers reported spending even less time doing homework than they did before and more time playing video games and on social media. The results suggest that youth clubs provide wider development benefits, perhaps through mentoring from youth workers that spill over into school performance and wider life. So, from either side of the divide, the youth worker or the youth club attendee, 
Tell me how youth clubs changed your life. Please, uh, hit the numbers now. You will get through. 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. And just bear in mind the next time someone is inviting you to share how awful the council services are in your area as proof of why the council shouldn't be getting more money to improve services. That This would be part of that. This could be part of that. It's the kind of thing that goes first when councils are compelled to, to, to cut their spending. But how did youth clubs change your life? 0345 973 James O'Brien on LBC. Here is a, a sentence that sums up my politics in a nutshell. And, and it, 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 in a way highlights how ignorant and bovine and dangerous the lazy right-wing rhetoric is. We can't afford it. Listen to this. The report estimates that for every pound saved from closing youth clubs, the cost to society is nearly three pounds. You do not have to be Carol Vorderman to work out that you're not actually saving anything. If you close a youth club, you are losing two pounds. The cost... Uh, for every pound saved, the cost to society is nearly three pounds because of the work that is done in these spaces. I'm not doing any self-flagellation this morning. I'm not wearing a hair shirt. But I think, having grown up in such a weird, um, uh, on such a weird course compared to most people, I, I opened the show today by talking about Scottish dancing classes at my prep school. Uh, the, 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 the importance of youth clubs has probably been lost on me over the years. And we're going to fix that today. Bashir is in Wandsworth. Bashir, what would you like to say? Oh, hi, James. How's it going? Uh, mate, I, I came on all excited then. I did it. Bashir is in Wandsworth. I did a big smile for the camera. And then you sounded a bit deflated. Oh, it is, it is a bit deflating what you're talking about because this is something I've been banging on about for about 15 years. Go on. Um, so just a bit of background. So my yes. mum, my late mother... She used to run, uh, voluntarily used to run youth clubs in sort of the late 90s, late 80s, 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. And they were in, in Wandsworth, primarily for, you know, for, for, for all children. So, firstly, it's a great way for children from all walks of life just to meet up. Because, yeah. you know... You except know, mine. Just... Except my walk of life. Yeah. Except Boris Johnson's walk of life. For all the other walks of well, life. Well, well no, but, he, no, no, <laughs> he, he, no, but he, even that, look... look, look Look, I, I, I went to public. I, you know, my parents were well off. I went to public school. Okay. But I'd go to the youth club and I'd meet up with people from all the local estates behind my house. And Lovely. It's a great way of everyone, you know, being on, 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 the, on the same level and getting along and making friends. Why did your and mum so, do it? Do you know? Yeah, just because there, there was, a bit, you know, it, it, particularly in, in our sort of Asian community, there weren't that many activities going on. So right. she used to, there were two things she did. She did, she did youth clubs. And she also did a lunch club every day for old women. She sounds so amazing. Old Asian ladies. Yeah, no, she was. Oh. So um, she used to do um, uh, a, a lunch club as well where she, you know, a minibus would go around, pick yeah. up all the sort of lonely old women that were sitting at home alone because all their families were out and about, yeah. pick them up, bring them there, and they'd all cook together, spend, spend a few hours together, and the minibus would drop them home. So that she used to do during the day. And then on sort of weekends and during school holidays, she used to run... Um, youth services so she used to do um, uh, a play scheme on, on during holidays so parents she used to make sure that parents did pay a little bit just so they valued it of course it's free that you don't value it oh, okay. so they'd pay like you know 20p 50p yeah. and for the whole day the kids would be there doing activities sports you know day trips to like Chessington or wherever and um, and, and I mean I mean the, the regular thing that we used to have was you know every Saturday and Sunday there used to be the youth clubs so every, you know for two three hours every, every weekend uh, on, on, on each day and our local one uh, that we used for many years was Westside Youth Club which was in um, Wandsworth in Southfields and uh, Westside was probably the only youth facility for you know up until you get to Battersea which you all know is, is quite quite a way away. Yeah. So we were using that, you know, throughout throughout the late eighties, nineties, early two thousands. Then the the Conservative run council in sort of mid early two thousand, uh, well mid two thousands was sort of said, you know, uh, we're closing it down for whatever reason. Well, we're not closing it down. Uh, your youth services, you, you, know, you know, the different groups that were using it can't use it because of you know some structure issue or something. They made something up, which okay. wasn't a big deal. Could have so they were providing some deal. funding, were they prior to that? Yes. So, yeah. so the funding kept getting cut. Well, you know, you can't do it without. You can't. You can't do it yeah, on, yeah. on on in, on in the nineties and stuff. Yeah. There was loads of funding for it, right. but then they eventually they stopped funding. But then they, you know, they stopped letting people use it. 
So they stopped letting people use Westside Youth Club in sort of the mid sort of 2000s. Mm. Then in 2010, you know, they, they basically said, oh, we're, we're putting out bids for developers to buy it. And so we did a petition saying, you know, went around all the estates, got loads of signatures saying, you know, don't shut it down. You know, people want to use it. It's the only use of this here. Uh, but ultimately, they did what they wanted to do. They sold it. And now a youth club that was, you know, serving hundreds, if not thousands of children is now four terraced houses. So, um, you know, and, and I've, I've seen the benefit, not just to me, but to um, hundreds of children. That describe describe it to me, because, you know, by dint of, of, of your parents' financial situation, you, you probably didn't need it as much as um, kids who didn't have a home life like yours. You know, you, you'd have found other, you would have, there would have been other things for you to do, other places for you to go. So describe what impact you think it had on people. No, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, the, the impact it had, you know, the, fir- the first thing I'd say is a lot of the problems we have with young people today would be solved by, with, with, with more youth clubs and activities. The problem kids, kids have these days, it's very simple. Any trouble that is caused is caused due to boredom mm. uh, or mm. not being supervised. So my mum was, was very, had, had, was very passionate about making sure kids were constantly engaged in something and supervised in something. As soon as you stop supervising children or, or they're bored, that is when trouble starts. That's when they, you know, cause mischief. No no, no child is innately bad. They're just bored, right? And they want to do something. And if, and if, and if the adults, politicians, local government, whoever, can't provide them the outlet to do that, then, you know, the inevitable is going to happen. And just having more police or, or whatever it is, isn't going to solve the problem. You need to engage children. So, like, we... we, we you know, I saw, you know, loads of kids that were, when they were younger, were up to a lot of, a lot of trouble. As soon as they started to come to, 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 to the youth club and, and play schemes and stuff like that, you know, they didn't have the opportunity to cause mischief because they were just constantly busy. They were engaged. They, they were busy. Their bandwidth, their bandwidth was taken up. And, and that's, that's a story for our ages, isn't it? And, and, you know, we need more housing before anybody sends me a clever clogs text. But there are, you know, uh, there's room for both. And, and the prioritisation there of profit uh, 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 or at least of property developers over hundreds of children especially the ones as, as ba- Bashir reminds us from from deprived backgrounds the difference that it makes the difference that it makes we think kids are okay because they're quiet that's one of the consequences of screens they're not like you can, I think you can probably still be bored in one sense while engaged in another on on, on a screen but are you I think what you get from this I, 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 I don't want to turn into a, a TED talk but I think there's a class element to this that's really important. So many of our lawmakers, particularly in the last few years, the last 20 years, 30 years, have come from privileged backgrounds. You know, the number of Labour politicians that are privately educated has only recently tipped the other way. So maybe maybe we've just had lawmakers that don't, and local politicians will be exactly the same. So youth club, you think, oh, come off it. A bunch of kids playing table tennis, what good can that do? But actually, the more you think about it, the bigger the impact becomes. And if you want to be fiscal about it, if you want to be all kind of, we can't afford it about it, then um, riddle me this. How can it be good economics if every pound saved from closing it costs society nearly three pounds subsequently because of what the kids will do and where the kids will go instead? Thank you, Bashir. I, 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 I could tell you wobbled a bit there when I talked about your mum. I hope, I hope that was a happy wobble i'm sure it was but um she sounds like an incredible woman more more people like bashir's mum much fewer problems with our young people who we often talk about in such a sort of derogatory and denigrating way as if we were never young ourselves here's thomas watts with the headlines james o'brien on lbc it is 11:32. yasmin gets it my youth club saved me when i was a teenager james things could have turned out so differently had it not been there i probably would have ended up taking drugs and getting into trouble with the police instead i ended up being a dj and competing in sports and dancing events listen this line here should really be tattooed across the eyelids of councillors shouldn't it and and politicians and of course um blowhard right-wing commentators it it estimates that for every pound saved from closing youth clubs the cost to society is nearly three pounds back to the phones in one second but first this from chris in leeds he writes i wouldn't say they prevented me from going rouge james do you know what mate i wish i could find something to prevent me from going rouge I, i i seem to go rouge by the week 
if I carry on going as rude as I'm going at the moment, I'm going to have to start wearing makeup in the studio or something like that. But I, I don't know what could... Oh, you mean rogue. It's a typo. It, I, I wouldn't say that they prevented me from going rogue. I didn't, by the way. But I think it just gave me more options of things to do and skills of how to make friends and interact with people that you didn't know before. Yeah, of course. I, I'm not suggesting for a minute that... Um, this is a story of, of the path not taken for everybody and the other path leads where Yasmin suggests to, to criminality and drug abuse but but it, but it's a win it's it's good for everybody 33 after 11 it gives you things you can't get anywhere else Janet's in Gants Hill Janet what made you pick up the phone because I just wanted to um, inform you and agree with you of the most wonderful experience I had at youth club um, an East End youth club in the mid 50s and early 60s Gosh. and in fact our youth club leaders were john sopel's parents <laughs> oh, and they were lovely. an amazing amazing james inspiration to all us east end kids it it was it was a really fantastic place there was there was table tennis there was discussions there was cookery there was a country house in bishop's daughter and we yes. thought we were going miles and there there was camp at goring by sea and you made friends for life. It was, it, and it was inspirational. Educationally, it was inspirational because we had, you know, temporary youth club leaders from universities, and you know, it just made me want to go forward. I, I, um, I, I know a bit about this because John told me about it when he was on full disclosure earlier this year. And, and that's you, right. You had gyms, big halls. There was a synagogue yeah, in the basement, a play area on the roof. Uh, and and um, his mum and dad main... started off as social workers and, and, and then became the wardens of the whole place. So he lived inside it. He lived exactly. in it. Exactly. Yeah, I remember him as a baby. And a friend of mine used to babysit him, but not me, I hasten to add. No. Um, um, the thing was, remember, we all came from really small flats. Yes. And to go somewhere so huge and spacious, that was also a lovely thing. Yes, of you course. Know, and, you know, somewhere, if you wanted to do a bit of homework there, you could. And... You know, you, yeah, you made friends for life, James. It, it was, it was wonderful. Really. Oh, what, a love, what was it? Was it the Bernhard Baron settlement? Or? It was the Bernhard Baron settlement. Yes. It was started by Sir Basil Henricus, and it was one of the East End settlements. You know, there were many. Yes. Um, uh, East End. Uh, to help Hall integration was, as well, to help yes. Jewish immigrants and their, and their children slide more effortlessly into into British society. Well. Funny, funny you should say that because, you know, my par my father was from the Ukraine, my mother was from Holland, Gosh. but my, my, my father wanted me to go to Oxford and St. George's rather than Brady Club because he said it had a better boxing record. So that was <laughs> And, and, how, and how many belts did you win, Janet, in the end? None, none at all. <laughs> but also he liked the fact that it was integrated. Boys and girls. No, no, um, um, Jewish and, and oh, non-Jewish sorry. People. Yes, yes, exactly. That. Well, and boys and girls as well, fully integrated. Oh, yeah, boys and girls. Well, yeah. that's the point and that, that Bashir, was, Bashir was making a moment ago about it being a place where you could meet people that you might not have met in your ordinary exactly. round of, of exactly. socialising with, with your, within your own community. That's right. It, and, you know, it was just a really magical time and a wonderful place. And friends for life, James. Oh, friends for life. That's lovely. I shall pass that on if he's not listening. And I yeah, please, I, please. I presume he is, Janet, frankly. He gets all his ideas from this programme for his <laughs> for the News Agents podcast. Yeah. But if, if by chance he isn't, I shall pass that on because everyone remembers his parents fondly, don't they? Wonderful. Oh, Dr. lovely Miriam, stuff. wonderful. Right. Yeah, I, yeah I, I, read, I think I read a letter when she died. Was it, what, did, what did they call What was her nickname? Um, no, her name was Miriam, but his name was Sos. I don't actually know his real name. <laughs> I've had, well, I, I'm, I'm sure John will listen back to this with joy. Thank you, Janet. And, I mean, a reminder, of course, we're talking about it in 2024, but it was obvious in the 1950s that the, the impact this would have. A lot more deprivation and poverty around then. So we've made progress in some areas, but right-wing politicians, and I'm sorry to get on that horse, but it's true, hit the reverse gear on this kind of thing whenever they get into power. And then we wonder why there are declines in other areas of... of well, uh, there are consequences in other areas. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Stephen is in Tempo in County Fermanagh. Stephen, what made you pick up? Is it Tempo? I've not heard of Tempo before. Yes, it is. Yes, Tempo you, as in the musical do you have a good? Yes. Do you have a good time in Tempo? Well, sorry. Here, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we do. Go it's a little small village. Oh, lovely stuff. Well, what, what made you pick up the phone? Yes, um, here, j just I suppose we're slightly uh, a slight opposite comment in that um, we've actually got our youth club 
uh, up, up and running again very oh, recently fantastic. due to a small bit of funding from our local council. How interesting. And having access to our local community centre and we can already see the benefits. And so you've done really it yourself, good. you're involved in this. Yes, so my wife will be more heavily involved than I am, but I also chip in, and it's through our sort of connections with our local football club. So between the football club and the community centre, got some funding, got the youth club up and running. Um, and you just see, as of last night, for example, yeah. um, the kids could go and play basketball, table tennis, computer games, whatever they wanted. There was a, a, a group of girls who were sitting crafting for mm. gifts for the Christmas fair, um, sitting chatting, no phones, relaxed. Um, this so shouldn't just, this shouldn't be delighting as should it? This should have been. Yeah. This should never have stopped being normal. No, um, and it's just it's it's a great unstructured environment where kids can just chill out, hang out, and um, you know there's obviously adults around to supervise them to make sure nothing mad happens. Sure. But it's just unstructured because school is structured, sport is structured, life is structured. There's got to be spaces where you can just hang out and relax. Beautifully put. Where, where did the impetus come from then to get it back up and running? Um, I suppose, well, traditionally, uh, myself, I'm in my mid-40s now. When I was a kid, in yeah. my mid-teens, we had a youth club. Um, usual stuff, played sports a couple of nights a week. Great great fun, great crack. And <laughs> we just here, we just, as we then become I parents... Just need, I mid-40s, should just clarify for non-Irish listeners. <laughs> sorry. Yes. <laughs> Crack, Sorry, is, yes. crack is a synonym for time, funnily enough. Yeah, you had a great I'm time. Gonna, having a great time and good fun, yes. yes. Um, we, we just thought, here, here, we'd love to get this back up and running because, yeah, here you in, in the winter evenings... It's self-evident. What are the kids going to do instead? What did they do instead? And, and, and just, you know. Yeah, they just come home, do their homework, and probably sit on their phones. That's it. So... <laughs> That's great. Um, uh, that, I mean, yeah. you don't need to say anymore, and it will make huge changes to society. And if you if you if you're penny pinching, or you think about the the, the 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 cost of everything and the value of nothing, then you'll also be saving society at large money with every every pound you spend on the on the youth club itself. What a lovely story, touching a lot of people today. Michael's been in touch. This is fantastic. I've never made the connection before between youth clubs and social integration. I've been saying for years that kids using online socialising more than physical will be a great detriment to society in the future. You only really socialise online with people that you already know. Um, I, I, Cameron, I don't need a spelling lesson on, uh, on, on crack. I, 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 I don't need... Tra- uh, uh, guidance on on what that word might mean elsewhere but i felt some people listening might do um alan has a sense of humor that is pitifully close to mine when he writes i bet all the locals have a good time at the weekend when they all go up tempo well done uh and jennifer helpfully writes james do not say grand i don't think i did did i i didn't say grand. is that the first time i've ever spoken to a caller from ireland without saying grand i think it might be oh it's grand uh alex is in greenwich alex what made you pick up the phone Hi, James. Um, so I'm still chuckling at the up-tempo comments. <laughs> oh, well, really? I don't encourage him. Honestly, Sorry. please. It's bad enough. Carry on. <laughs> Basically, I just wanted to say, um, I benefited greatly from, from um, a youth club in my area. I went to both Air Cadets and Army Cadets. Oh, yeah. Um, Are they still honest, around, though? Because that funding would come from the Ministry of Defence, wouldn't it, rather than from well, local that, councils? That's what I thought. But I'm, I'm thinking back to, what, 2016, maybe a little bit earlier. Yeah. Um, when the Tories came into power, they closed a lot of a lot of the army cadet units. Um, oh, really? So, I did not know yeah. that. Yeah. So a lot, a lot of the ones around... Austerity. So this is austerity. Yeah. Part of what, I didn't Precisely. know. Crikey, I didn't know that. What did you get out of it? Because I, I, I hated it, but at my school it was compulsory. So it's a very different experience from yours. I mean, to be honest, so what I got out of it was it brought me out of my show and allowed it showed me the person that I should be growing into, if that makes sense. Gosh. Um, my home life really, really wasn't that great. And it, for the first time in my life, I really, it was it, like my eyes were open to it, yeah. that, that, it that it wasn't great. You know, um, yeah. and on top of that, we got like we got to, we got to do so many like prestigious things, take part in so many bougie parades and whatnot, like performing internationally on TV <laughs> and newspapers and blah blah blah. You know, <laughs> just opened up horizons you didn't even know existed before you arrived uh, in the middle of them. Absolutely, do you know what I mean? And I think it's something that needs that, that, that something does need to be done about it. Do you know what I mean? It's really um, sad, isn't it, when you think about how obvious it is that these are forces for good and how callous it was and unthinking it was to, to, to strip them away. I had no idea yeah. that austerity reached into the cadet force. Well, yeah. Why did you join both? Why were you in both? 
Um, so I started off in army cadets, um, yeah. and I had a little tiff with my OC. Um, that he was doing stuff that he shouldn't have been doing, and okay. I was going to report it. So as retaliation, he kicked me out. Good lord! And then I, uh, so I upgraded to air, to air cadets. Where, um, yeah, did, my did OC you? Was, can, 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 I'm going to ask you something, right? Yeah. Go on. Did you ever go flying in a chipmunk? Yes. Oh, no, I went, no, we kid. we went in a, we went in gliders, and we went in. Because um, they told me we were going to do that at my school, right? <laughs> They had all three groups of cadets. They had a Navy cadets, they had Army cadets, they had RAF cadets. And you had to do it on Tuesday afternoons. It was the one day where you didn't play rugby or, or, or play um, cricket. And, and you, you, so you did cadets. And you go along as a kid. So first first week at school, 13 years old. And they, they make a pitch, Alex. They, they, the, yeah. the, so the Navy bloke would say, you should join the Navy. You should be a Navy cadet. We'll do this and we'll go to Dartmouth. And, and then the Army cadet says, you can shoot guns if you join the Army cadets. You can come and shoot guns. We've got our own shooting range. You go on hikes. And then the RAF bloke said, sign up for the RAF and you'll go flying. You'll go yeah. flying in gliders and chipmunks. So me and my mates, we all signed up for the RAF cadets. We, the nearest we ever got to an aeroplane was a slideshow. <laughs> which was almost that whenever it was raining, it was called aircraft recognition. Did you do that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you yeah, did so do I, that. That was, was one of my most hated subjects. Yeah, actually. because you're sitting there and there's the most boring man in the universe pressing a slideshow <laughs> and a new aeroplane appears on the screen. You're supposed to write down what it is. Two years I did that. Wing Commander yeah. Biddy called me the worst cadet he'd ever had the misfortune <laughs> of encountering in 20 years as school's liaison officer. And I never, ever got close to an aeroplane. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, there's always been a little bit, there's always been a, a big red area around flying regarding health and safety and whatnot. Yeah, along fair with funding enough. too. So, um, but like one of the things that they brought in, uh, I think it was already in when I was in cadets. I mean, I've been out for like 10 years now. Right. Um, but you can now get, you're more likely to get a flying scholarship. So, but if you join yeah. at minimum age, by the time you're 16, you could be a fully qualified pilot. Can't go, can't argue with that, can you? Do you know what I mean? I mean it's, I, it's just, I think there needs to be more opportunities like that out in, out in this country, you know? Well, it's, it's a no brainer to me. And it is another thing that hopefully this Labour government has, has, has got on the on the list or got in its sights. And of course, it would involve just uh, ignoring all the people saying council services are terrible in my area. So how dare they raise the council tax? I think, again, I, I struggle with the logic of that. But there it is. Things like that being shut down. Alex, you're a star. Thanks for that. Still bitter, though. I, 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 I still bitter. Also, they unified. They don't, did you? I mean, did you? Those trousers. Oh, he's gone. Those trousers they made as well. They're like those. those, those uh, it's probably time to get over it. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 11.49. I'm not alone. I, I feel seen. Paul is in Ascot. Describes his legs as itchy. I remember those trousers, James, he says. We used to call them Harry Marys, did you? Um, they were they were extraordinary. And they had no shape to them at all. They were sort of like uh, big. They weren't shaped, but flat. Anyway, that's... That's the end of my uh, RAF cadet service reminiscences. Uh, I, uh, I talked earlier about stories that you know you have to talk about, but there is a temptation to turn away. I think far too many people are turning away from stories concerning Israel's continuing uh, commission of carnage in the Gaza Strip and latterly, of course, in Lebanon. We heard at the end of last week about some members of the military now saying the quiet parts out loud, talking about ethnic cleansing of the Gaza Strip as an actual policy. I, I'm, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this because of data protection and things like that, but I'm tempted to ring back all the people who at the end of last year were absolutely adamant that nobody had anything to worry about. It was all about defeating Hamas and or rescuing the hostages. It had absolutely nothing to do with ethnic cleansing or even, as, as some people attest, is already happening, genocide. And there was absolutely no way that civilians were going to be killed indiscriminately in order to keep Benjamin Netanyahu in power. And we could ring them back one by one, play out a little bit of the call. Uh, some people got quite cross with me. Some even called me anti-Semitic, would you believe, for expressing fears about the direction in which the traffic may end up going. Um, and now it's there. It's not just going in that direction. It's parked smack in the middle of that kind of conduct. Uh, so ring them back, play a little bit of the call, especially the ones that were rude to me, and then ask them how they feel about being proved so catastrophically, tragically, um, and heinously wrong by the actions of Benjamin Netanyahu in the Israeli Defence Force. I think that might be quite a, a, a sobering listen for people. Because I turn your attention next to a report from Human Rights Watch, the US-based group that does exactly what it says on the tin um, and their latest investigation into so-called ev evacuation orders being pursued to 
um, uh, facilitate the, quote, deliberate and massive forced displacement of Palestinian civilians in Gaza. Nadia Hardman is a refugee and migrant rights researcher at Human Rights Watch and the author of this report. Um, Nadia, tell me more. Thanks for having me in your program. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, I spent the last year working with colleagues at Human Rights Watch to unpack and essentially debunk Israel's claim that it is evacuating people safely in Gaza. We analyzed over 184 evacuation orders, um, basically looking at the entire evacuation system. What, what is, just just explain to me what an evacuation order is. I mean, I, 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 I'm not completely stupid. I appreciate that the language is probably quite self-explanatory, but, but if I got one, what would that involve me having to do? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, they're basically instructions to leave. So the Israeli military have been disseminating leaflets, text messages across the Gaza Strip. And so, you know, on the face of it, it looks like it's giving people ample warning to leave areas because they're going to be imminent hostilities. And so, you know, we started to look at this and to really understand, is this an appropriate evacuation system? There's laws around this. There are the laws of war say an occupying power such as Israel can move people but it has to be for their safety and there has right. to be an imperative military reason and you have to give them time to move and you have to move them safely through evacuation routes that are safe and to evacuation places that are safe and instead what we found is the a horrifying um, disaster of, of, of abuses and when it comes to the actual evacuation orders they were inconsistent they were erroneous they didn't give people enough time to move you'll probably remember the October 13 order which gave people initially just 24 hours to move. That's over a million people from the north to the south. Then what we've seen throughout the conflict are just a, a series of orders which made no sense and just sowed terror and confusion in the population. And then if you add to this the humanitarian situation, and again, international law says, if you want to evacuate people, you have to give them food and water and shelter. And instead, what we've seen is Israel using starvation as a weapon of war. We've seen how safe zones rapidly change. The Al Mawasi humanitarian safe zone, this area which Israel keeps on telling people to go to, has changed its boundaries at least 14 times. And we verified attacks in these safe zones. And then one safe zone suddenly becomes a combat zone. We know nowhere is safe in Gaza. And maybe the most important element of the war crime of forced displacement is the fact that Israel is rendering the Gaza Strip uninhabitable, either through reckless bombing and, and its you know air campaign, or through intentional raising and bulldozing of buildings and areas and in those spaces where we see these new security corridors, a buffer zone, a road which now bifurcates the north and the south of Gaza, they're just emptied spaces. And this is where we say that, that Israel has ethnically cleansed Palestinians from these areas. And as I alluded to shortly before you came on, so some members of the Israeli mi military have, have come perilously close to, to conceding that publicly now. And, and uh, I mean, reports that it, it is actually a, an established plan, albeit one that I think Benjamin Netanyahu's government still still denies. Um, uh, uh, I, I, if, so where is safe now in the uh, Gaza no. Strip? James Nowhere is safe in the Gaza Strip. There is, uh, the, I think the Strip is now 84% under evacuation orders. If you imagine how many people... And it's, so eventually you, you, you have 100% evacuation orders while still pretending that yeah. there's somewhere safe to go. Right, exactly, exactly. Because if you have attacks consistently in, in these safe zones, and you, you, you spoke about the, the statements. I mean, we spent a lot of time analyzing the statements from the beginning of the war to, to, to now from senior officials, which is evidence of a state policy to forcibly displace. They've spelled this out. They've called for the voluntary migration of Palestinians yeah. in Gaza from outside the territory. So that is where we see evidence of a state policy and where it's a, it amounts to a crime against humanity. And I mean, you know, it's important to always draw attention to what we're recommending. We're not just gathering this evidence. We, we recommend that the International Criminal Court's prosecutor add forced displacement, investigate forced displacement as a crime against humanity, and the prevention of the right to return. Um, we, we also, of course, recommend that governments, including the UK, suspend military assistance and weapons transfers. I mean, again, you have answered this question, but I feel I should ask it again. Return to what? 
Exactly. I mean, this is, I mean, you know, the, the reality is there is nowhere to return to for, for, for the majority of the population. I mean, the destruction is just, it's unfathomable. In our report, we include graphics of satellite imagery, which just, which you know, display before and after. You're talking about agricultural lands, greenhouses, hospitals, schools, universities. People, how are people meant to live their lives even once, you know, and hopefully if this, this, this war ends, there is not much to return to. And the UN has estimated it will cost 40 to $50 billion dollars to rebuild in an effort not seen since the Second World War. And of course, we call for reconstruction, but we are very cognizant of the fact that this is a state policy to move people intentionally from, from their homes. And, and, and an illustration, once again, of course, of the um, uh, compounding of the situation by Israel's refusal to let foreign journalists into, into the territories concerned, because, of course, we would rather not be relying on drone footage and, and, and overhead cameras. Absolutely. There, there, there are many brave men and women who would like nothing more than to get there now with their, with their notebooks and their cameras. Absolutely. I mean, we had to do this entire report, which is why it took such a long time remotely. You know, I spent hours, days trying to get people that were charging their phones, who were running away from from various battlegrounds, you know, just to get the, the interviews that we needed. And, you know, we used all this open source technology and there are so many brave journalists and, and you know, people getting the information out there. But it's really tough. But we've amassed so much evidence. It's 154 pages of evidence, plus graphics and, and satellite imagery that's you know irrefutable and of course we've put these allegations or this 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 evidence to the Israeli authorities but we have not received a reply uh, for people who need a little bit of help grasping grasping the bigger picture I, I, and I, I don't know that you will have much to say about this but I want to get it out into the same space as this conversation because Donald Trump's nomination for the US ambassador to Israel although not Jewish, which breaks precedent, has said um, that there is no such thing as a Palestinian. He's described the Palestinian issue as simply a political tool to try to force land away from Israel. How, how significant is the change of administration on the horizon in, in, in Washington? Given those I mean, words, look, I don't want to preempt what sure. hasn't happened, right? I don't, I don't want to preempt. I don't want to predict. At the same time, you know, Biden gave a 30-day deadline for more humanitarian trucks to enter enter the Gaza Strip, and that has woefully failed. And we've seen no consequence. The Biden administration can right now. Um, before President-elect Trump comes into power, do something, um, and that is in the for uh, that is in the form of, of suspending military assistance and weapons transfers. It's as simple as that. It's publicly condemning these war crimes as for what they are, crimes against humanity. Um, you know, we'll wait and see what happens, but we're focused on what can happen now because the the messages I receive from people are devastating. Every day they update me and say, "Oh, well, I'm still alive," and you know. <laughs> the urgency cannot be uh, translated more. But the, the, I mean, the clear blue water between what was stated uh, at, at, towards the end of last year and what is happening now is, is clear to anybody honest. But if somebody were to argue that this is a necessary um, consequence of the tireless pursuit of Hamas terrorists, what would your evidence offer up in, um, in challenge to that view? Sure. I think, you know, one of the things about this war crime of forced displacement when you arbitrarily move people is there is such a high threshold, usually in the laws of war, you can do, um, you can conduct yourself according to military necessity. The, the standard in this war crime is there has to be an imperative military reason to move people. There must be no other feasible alternative. And so what what we've shown is that in each of these instances that Israel has said it has to move people, you know, it hasn't demonstrated the alternatives. It hasn't done any of that. It's, right. These claims are largely false. Um, thank you, uh, Nadia Hardman, a refugee and migrants rights researcher at Human Rights Watch and the author of this report, which you, you can read more about on their website or indeed in The Guardian. And The Guardian has con contacted the Israeli army for comment, although at the time of this conversation, no comment has been forthcoming. Um, it is 12 noon. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC and um, a, a rather violent change of tone after the news because it's Thursday. Which means it's mystery hour. James O'Brien on LBC. Oh, it's about the time. Four minutes after 12. I've actually got a mystery. And I've actually remembered it. I don't know what's happening to me. I thought my memory would get worse as I got older. But it, it seems to be getting better in some ways. Must be all the green tea. 
I, I, I've got a mystery that I, I don't know if it works as a mystery hour question or whether it is a whole hour of whimsical radio that we could do next time there's a by-election or something like that. I'll, I'll hold fire on that. But I can tell you that this is your weekly opportunity to achieve the sort of satisfaction not ordinarily available anywhere else on the radio dial. Um, I would like you to ring in with a question and invite others to ring in with an answer. It is pretty much that simple. Although the, the magic happens in the margins, doesn't it? The magic happens unexpectedly. It's been particularly funny over the last two or three weeks. Oddly, and perhaps not coincidentally, since I reintroduced one of the old rules of mystery. Rule isn't quite the right word, is it? One of the old c- c- promises, one of the old... Uh, pledges, one of the old mystery hour pledges, which was, of course, that you will have at least one laugh out loud moment, lol, one belly laugh between now and one o'clock. I used to have two promises. There were two pledges originally, were there? Or were there more than two pledges? That's not a mystery. Don't ring in. The first was, you will know more. I used to say it like this. You will know more by one o'clock than you do now. Uh, and and the second was that you will have at least one laugh out loud moment. You you will learn something new. You might not be grateful for it. You might have forgotten it by half past one. But in that that little moment at one o'clock, you would know something that you hadn't known before. But then we kind of moved into years and years and years of doing this. And I began to think, what if someone has listened to every single one and they have a really good memory? And, as has probably happened, we stumble into a mystery hour where every single question has actually been asked before, but I've forgotten. And therefore, you wouldn't know something new by the time you got to one o'clock today. And then I thought, I'm probably overthinking it, aren't I? And then I thought, maybe we should bring back the belly laugh rule as well. And lo and behold, we had some proper laughs. Um... And, and Andy points out, it, Mr. Harry is now so old that there aren't even any radio dials anymore, really, on most radios. Well, there are. You turn a dial, it's just on a digital screen telling you what you're seeing, isn't it? Well, it is on mine. It is on my... Uh, I bought one of those things that emulates the sunrise in the mornings. Did I tell you? So I, just, I get a bit miserable. Once, once, I hate getting up in the dark. It's why I could never do a breakfast show. I hate getting up in the dark. And... It, 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 it's a roundabout now, isn't it? So you get it first just before the clocks change, spring forward, fall back, just before the clocks go back. And and then it starts kicking in now. So by the beginning of the new year, you're getting up in pitch black. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. So I've got this thing that slowly goes through the kind of range of sun colours, goes from a quite a nice pale orange, which kicks off at about half past six, and then by 7 a.m., you can set it to do it for longer. By 7 a.m., it's it's white light. There's no blue light in it. That kid's about, Anyway, I don't know. all. The, anyway, I think it's working. It's why I'm so perky at the moment. I don't know if you've noticed how perky. Have you noticed how perky I am in the mornings? I'm quite perky. And that is, I think, I think that is the reason why. Um, Dan knows what I'm talking about. He says, I've had one for years. They're absolutely fantastic. And Paul says, that's a knob, not a dial, which could be in response to any part of this program frankly from 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 10 o'clock onwards eight minutes after 12 is the time um should we crack on now uh, oh hang on there's a prize there's a prize you can win a mystery hour ball game and christmas is around the corner so if you're a bit of a cheapskate what you do you ring in you, you make my favorite contribution of the week you win a mystery hour board game and you can give it to someone else for christmas and pretend that you bought it if you want to buy it, you can go to mysteryhour.co.uk where you will find out more about what is a, a wonderful um, box of fun for all the family. And the full terms and conditions for the competition element of it are at lbc.co.uk. Liam clearly listens to the programme far more than is healthy. He's already texted to say, can we crack on? Shall we crack on? Let's crack on. Gareth's in Wigan. Gareth, question or answer? It's a question, James. Carry on. Well, it was going to be about Scottish dancing, but yes. I thought I've left I've that hanging. It's built some tension there. I've got no, I've got no material. Like, that's it. That's the you know no, as much no, about I think, it. I think that's just a good one to keep forever. Yeah, just could, every so I, often, I just drop it in. I must tell you about those Scottish yeah. dancing classes I use. They're called reels. Did you know that they're called reels? Reeling reels. reels. Yeah, reels. Anyway, little bits, giving us tidbits. Anyway, yeah. the, question, <laughs> the question is, yes, <laughs> the question is, can you ever forget how how to swim? Oh. It's after you've learned 
So, like, if you never, if you haven't swum for like thirty or forty years or something like that, but you could swim, and then you fell in or even dived in, yes. would would nature kick in, or is there a chance you could just like flail your arms around and legs and? That's, well, I mean, there's a poignancy to this, isn't there, with with regard to you know dementia or something like that. But it would be oh, right. well. That we'd have to include that in the parameters of possibility. Yeah, if yeah, got, yeah. If you've yeah. forgotten your daughter's name, it's possible you've forgotten how to. Or what? Or what? You know, because people say stuff like, you know, oh, it's like riding a bike. Well, it's not like riding a bike because if, if you forget how to ride a bike, you just sit there and you don't move. Well, you, could, Whereas, you can't forget how to ride a bike, can you? Well, I think I it know. is like riding a bike. Obviously, the, the the dangers are greater, which I think is what you're alluding to. If you've forgotten how to swim, yeah. you, you could drown. You can't die by forgetting yeah. how to ride a bike unless you need to make a very quick getaway from some wild animals. Yeah, and you've uh, forgotten anyway, how to swim in one. Ride it's a, a swim bike. one. Yeah, it's a swim one because it's right. getting more dangerous. Yeah, you're on. Yeah, I like. Can you forget how to swim? Has anyone ever forgotten how to swim? Is really the best way of asking this question. I suspect they're the same. I suspect there's a kind of genetic, a sense memory involved because the momentum that you need on a bicycle and the momentum that you need to swim are probably similar in some psychological way. So you would be tapping into. Part, I don't know. Why am I even talking? Good question. Right. Has anyone ever forgotten how to swim? Thank you, Gareth. It is 10 minutes after 12. Antonio is in Ledbury. Antonio, question or answer? Question, please, James. Carry on. Yeah, I was just wondering, do fruit trees produce less or lower quality fruits? When? As trees get older. Oh, as they get older. Sorry. I, I just, uh, I, you left that quite open. <laughs> it, was, it, was a bit, it was a bit surreal, that question. Do they, what? Hello? Um, I, okay, so as a fruit tree gets older, does it... Does it does its does its yield diminish? Uh, so I live in Herefordshire, and I drive past like loads of orchards and things. And I, I saw orchards. recently, I'd seen recently some sort of like a new new plantation of trees. And I was wondering, yeah. is it a new harvest, or do they have to replant every so you know every so many years? I like that a lot. Where I live used to be orchards, and there's a couple have survived um, of trees. I, but I don't know. I mean, all around the parts of West London where I've lived for the last twenty years were orchards at one point. It's quite extraordinary. Um, uh, Brentford was famous for its apples. Did you know that, Antonio? I didn't know that. No, there was a, there was a fellow in Brentford who kind of did a bit of splicing and and came up with his own. Ver- there's hundreds of apples used to grow in Brentford, but I don't. But but the we know that the trees stay because you go past the old orchards as well. There's loads of orchards that have been there for ages around your neck of the woods. It's Bulmer, Bulmer family country, isn't it, Hereford? That's right. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't, I, the short answer is I don't know. Does a tree yield in quantity or quality diminish with age? You're on. It's a great question. Thank you. 03456060973 is the number that you need. 12 minutes after 12 is the time. Uh, Nicola is in Uxbridge. Nicola, question or answer? Hi, James. It's a question, please. Carry on, Nicola. Um, it's a question from my six-year-old daughter. She's asked me a couple of times and I didn't know the answer. Okay. Um, so I told her that I would ask you, and I told her about Mystery Hour. Marvellous. And she wanted me to ask you, so well, that's my what pleasure. I What's her name, because, so that we can say hello when she listens back? She's, she's at school now, is she? Or? She is at school, yeah, okay. she is. What's her name? Her name's Kira. Kira. Hi, Kira. I hope you had a good day at school. Let's find out whether or not anyone knows the answer to the question that your mum is about to ask on your behalf. I bet it's a very clever one, Kira, because I <laughs> bet you're a very clever little girl. Go on. Um, her question is, if somebody was to jump out of um, a window that's 100 floors up, would their parachute open in time? I like Kira. <laughs> <laughs> these are the, these are the, so what's base jumping? Isn't that, is that when you jump off things and with, with, with a parachute? So I, I, I think the answer is yes. But so she then would, I suppose then the question is kind of... How, how um, many floors? You can't change the question. Yeah. You can't change the question. So, Not, I, I mean, uh, uh, the average <laughs> of 100 stories would be how high. And then the question of whether or not anyone's ever base jumped from it yeah. would become... Yeah, you can. Sorry, my little boy's talking as well. She's saying, why aren't you asking my questions on the radio? <laughs> she, uh, Kira's your favourite. She always gets preferential treatment. This is outrageous. <laughs> Um, he's asking to watch more TV program, which is what he's doing at the moment. <laughs> I, th- I can tell you that a base jump from 500 feet will only have a parachute ride of about 10 to 15 seconds. So uh, we think of a parachute as floating gently to the ground. I think we need to think of it more as an emergency brake 
that kicks in just before impact. But whether or not 500 feet translates as 100, it wouldn't, would it? It'd be, it'd be, it'd be higher than it. So I'm going to go with yes. But I know that Kira will expect someone who's better qualified than me to answer this question. <laughs> so I'm confident that it's a yes, but I'm going to wait for someone who knows more to go definitive on it, Nicola. Brilliant. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Uh, 14 minutes after 12 is the time. So it's 100 stories with a parachute. Would it, would it save you in time? Uh, yes or no? And I don't know, Paul, stop it. Asking for the spec specifications of the parachute, any parachute, like the one that would be best suited to doing this. Come on. Kira knows what she's talking about, Paul, and carefully, even if you don't. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 17 minutes after 12. Mystery hour is upon us. Can you forget how to swim? Which uh, is a question that gave Steve his laugh out loud moment. He quite rightly pointed out that when Gareth said, if you forget how to ride a bike, you just sit there. And Steve has been in touch saying, no, you don't. You fall off. <laughs> And he's right, isn't he? <laughs> you can't really do that in swimming. Do fruit trees decline with age in terms of quantity or indeed quality of yield? And if you jump out of a window 100 stories up with a good quality parachute designed for such purposes, will you reach the ground safely? That is for Kira via Nicola. Uh, room for your questions, room for you to answer those as well. Uh, Bruce is in Swiss Cottage. Bruce, question or answer? It's a question, sir. Carry on. Um, can someone explain to me the phenomenon why two people can hear the same word differently? How do you mean? Okay. 2009. Yeah. The meerkats first appeared on TV adverts. Yeah. Compare the market. Yeah. My company made a limited edition of 500 Alexander meerkat toys with a sound chip inside them. Okay. Which, when you pushed his belly, it said simples. Simples. Yep. Yeah. We uh, gave them to Harry. Harrod took them. Okay. I then would have only happened twice. Right. Where a lady rang me up and she said, why does my meerkat not have simples in his belly? That's what you're talking about. Yeah. She said, it said haggis. Haggis? Haggis. Was it a Scottish meerkat? No, it was a Russian cat. Of course, they're all Russian. And she, I said, can you play it down the phone to me? Yeah. Which she did. And it said simples. And she said, no, it doesn't. It says haggis. Well, I, do you know what? I, I wasn't sure where you were going to go with this when I said, what do you mean? But that's a fairly comprehensive explanation. So y she hears haggis, you hear simples. Correct. I don't, you haven't got it, have you? You haven't got the same. I have. I found one just the other day from 2009, and it still works. So I emailed the clip to your young lady. She's she my has lady. She's my producer. Okay, Maybe so fine. we've got it here. So, so, so what we need to know, and please don't lie. Oh, a lot of people lie to me, Bruce, when I play games on the radio. I do things like the missing word round, and the answer is something like... Um, cauliflower and they pretend that they knew it so please don't lie we, we need to know whether or not anyone else hears correct you have, when yeah. when the rest of us will hear simple 99 percent i'd imagine will obviously hear it as it is hopefully there'll be one person who hears it well and then someone else would need to find her even more hopefully who can explain to us what is going on exactly so it's the audio equivalent of that dress that was around a few years ago exactly exactly Go exactly off. right you be quiet now bruce Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna clue, I'm gonna uh, cue cue the the cue the clip, but everyone has to be really really quiet. Okay, so this will be Alexander the meerkat, I think, to give everyone their dues. And again, well, I heard haggis. Did you not hear? Did you not hear haggis? Did you hear it? Listen, Project Keith, what did you hear? That's not helpful. Uh, last time. I'm hearing haggis now. Bruce. Hello. Help. No, everyone's hearing haggis cow. No one's hearing simples. What? You are hearing simples. Uh, what? Completely simples. No even hint of haggis. This is really weird. Everyone else... So, we've got loads more haggises than simples, Bruce. 
Maybe something what? happens when you play it over the radio. Possibly. It's also 15 years old, James. Oh, so it might, have de- it might have deteriorated. Exactly. But anyway, regardless of what people heard now, back yeah. when it was box fresh, most yeah. people heard simples and this lady heard haggis. Maybe... Uh, sure. Right, you're on. This is weird and, and also slightly unnerving. And, and now it's going about 50-50 with all the messages. No, Haggis has definitely got a bit of a head start on... Oh, I'm really scared now. I think we might have done something bad, like saying something backwards into a mirror, Bruce. Well, there you go. There you go. Are you still in the business of, of novelties and toys? Uh, no, it's all a right. long story. Okay, no. well, I will do it next time. Okay. All right, Bruce. 22 minutes after 12 is the time. I don't know what happened there, but I, I definitely heard Haggis, and so did many, many other people, but definitely not all of them. So it's... May, I don't know. Well, someone tell us what's going on. Please, please. It's not normal mystery out of this. I mean it. Please, someone tell us what is going on. 12.22 is the time. Sam's in queue. Sam, question or answer? Oh, hi, James. Hello, um, I am actually in um, Purbeck at the moment. Oh. I've moved from Kew. Oh. Um, yeah, I do, do apologise for misrepresenting your locale in that way. Well, it's OK. It's relevant to my question, actually. It's Is another it? orchard-based question. Wow, you wait and, years um, for one to come along and then you get two in the space of ten minutes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And um, so um, for the last couple of years, I've been uh, living in Purbeck and lots of orchards everywhere. I'm... Uh, privy to a re- really lovely pub it's in the place called Worth Matravers in the middle of nowhere and mm. we, they manufacture manufacture their own cider and um, cider. I've been involved in uh, yeah it's very hard to say once you've been there for a couple of years without pronouncing it cider I know, I know. But, um, I'm, I'm impressed by your uh, assimilation uh, I'm, I'm kind of keeping my London route there yeah. but um, basically um, so with the cider um, we pick all the apples we uh, press them we put them in cheeses we uh squeeze it all and it's all um, brewed for uh, I think yeah, about six months and it mm. comes out uh, after the process is involved it comes out at about six percent alcohol right. um, now I uh, it's not much to be proud of but um, I can drink a few beers I can easily easily consume four or five pints of normal yeah. regular lager which is around about five percent alcohol yeah. and I, I I'll be fine um, if I consume even three or four pints of this 6% um, cider, I am ruined. I am wobbly. It, 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 has a, it, has a, it has a weird effect. It has like a, it, it, it gets your legs, it gets your legs drunk first. And then uh, two, two pints, you're a little bit wobbly. Yeah. It comes up and then by, by three or four, your cheeks are glowing. It's like a cartoon. You've it's got like, a uh, you're, you, and, and, if I were, to, I have, I've never got past four or five pints. Of well, this don't stuff. try. Promise me. No, no, no. no. It's 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 it's, well, it's, it's, I, it's, it's wicked, wicked. But uh, in the interest of science, couldn't you have found a lager that was six percent to do a proper test? Um, well, yeah, and that, that's a good question, James. And I have, um, oh. and I can. Yeah, they they do have within this this lovely pub. Uh, also, have like quite strong lagers that are five six percent, and. As I say, I can, I can on a good session on a so on so, a, so another, comparable on a ABV, and yet the mm-hmm. cider takes you to places that the lager just can't. Yeah, yeah. That's Why? A good way of putting it. Could you be? Um, yeah. <laughs> Remy says, are you possibly allergic to apples, and you're having a sort of mild anaphylactic shock when your legs uh, go? <laughs> well, no, I don't believe so. I do, don't believe so, and uh, you know it's. Uh, as I say, it's a very natural, organic, homegrown product. There are chemicals in it. There, it's like um, everyone's it's at it now. Jamie says, "Did you say pick all the apples or pickle the apples <laughs> or haggis?" Very good. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, well, I heard haggis as well in that. But, I, I think uh, that I think it's a psychological mistake. I think that if I had said simple, 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 simples, and then we'd played it, everyone would have heard simples. But because he'd put haggis, Bruce had put haggis in all of our brains. So. Mm. Just yep. as you're putting cider in all of our brains now. So why does cider affect you differently to other drinks despite mm. having a similar alcohol content? Yeah. I mean, is it exactly the same it. question? I mean, it always used to be claims that Stella Artois brought out the football hooligan in you, even if you drunk the same amount of alcohol of a different variety of beer or lager. Stella was supposed mm. to have it. So it could be the same as that question if that's true if it's true yeah 
I'm person. partial to a bit of Stella. I've never had that effect on me, really. The difference between a 4% and a 5%, I've never really Picked up clocked. On. No. But, um, okay. I, I mean, that does, does cider affect people? Well, it does affect Sam differently. So there's two questions, really. Why? Or... Does it affect us all in that way? Does cider? Why, why would you have a different reaction to cider from the reaction you'd have to lager, even though the alcohol content was comparable? I like that, Sam. I, I worry a bit about you. I mean, you, you should probably take a couple of nights off a week just for your liver's sake. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But, um, you know, the whole process of manufacturing the cider, we've made 18,000 litres of the stuff over the last month or Who's so. Who's we? And... Um, well, it's as I say. Um, I, I'm uh, there's a pub there. Um, can I name the pub? Yeah. Um, now let me guess so, what it's called. Is it called the Something and Compass? Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. It's, it I is. It I know my pubs, does, mate. I know my pubs. It doesn't need a lot of advertising. It's been in a lot of uh, um, uh, it's the Square and Compass. The square and Compass. That was it. In, was in it. Worth Worth Matravers. Yes. But yeah, they have their own uh, cider factory. Um, and you've been help. The, you've been helping out. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've sort of just been volunteering. We go go for the and you get paid inside, do you? We, we um, pretty much, pretty yeah. much, and we have a, have a few ciders throughout the day. This is like taking and, a um, call I'm, from I'm, the nineteenth century. This is <laughs> fantastic. I could probably answer the orchard, uh, the uh, trees question, but I know the rules, so you I'm do not know them. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. Thank you for respecting the the, the the rigmarole, and we shall try and get you an answer. So, why does that cider affect Sam and possibly everybody differently from? Um, from others, from, from other similar alcohol content. Uh, I don't know why that sounded. It was almost like the tourist board on the phone then, wasn't it? Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Don't you fancy going to Purbeck now, having a pint or two in the in the square and compass? Oh, absolutely glorious. All human life is here. Paul is in Worcester Park. Paul, question or answer? Um, answer. Carry on. Okay, let me just go to a bit of a clearer signal place. Right about the parachute thing. So. Oh, yes. I'm 67 years old now. When I was about 20, I was in the army, I used to do army parachuting. Yeah. Working out on the fact that a 100 story building, roughly eight foot per story, you're talking about 800 feet. Yeah. Okay. I don't know why I'm writing this down, but I want to feel involved. Carry on. Yeah, they'll, 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 I think it's eight foot, but yeah, even if it's seven, that would make it less. Regularly, regularly speaking, with old fashioned parachutes back in the 70s, carrying kit, we would jump at 800 feet and land quite safely. You can't even jump at less. And I'm talking about old army parachutes from the 70s. So you would certainly be able to do it even, even at a lower height than 100 stories now because yeah. parachutes are so much better developed. I mean, so the answer is a definite yes. For Kira, it's a definite yes. Qualifications. Paul has jumped from 800 feet with a parachute. You can't get better qualifications than that, can you? But, I mean... I suppose Kira being six, she could point out you haven't actually jumped out of a window at a, 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 at one hundred stories. No, that is true. But our balloon jump, our first jump ever, was from a balloon hanging in a little wicker basket from oh, beneath yeah. the balloon. Oh. And although it's a yeah, you do that's when you do your first jump on to see if you're uh, if you haven't got the minerals to do the actual jump, it saves them a lot of money just to wind you up in a crate under a balloon. Yeah. And if I remember rightly, though, I'm going a long way back. I think that was also from about eight hundred feet. And uh, say so that was the like, very old-fashioned parachute. Like parachute moved on no, so, I like much, this. so I, much more now. I, I, I mean, the problem is with base jumping, which is closer uh, to what uh, specifics of, of, of Kira's question, is that it's really, really, really dangerous and a lot of people die. But, but there will true. be a record, won't there? There will be the lowest possible... But the lowest recorded height from which someone has successfully done a parachute jump. It's going to be a lot less than 800 or even 700 feet. I, I think it's around about 500 feet now because the, yeah, uh, the way the parachutes have developed now with knowledge of aerodynamics and everything is far in advance of what it used to be. But 800 was a good margin, definitely from a balloon, from a wicker basket handle under a balloon. And that was with, uh, and that wasn't with kit, but it was with like no. 12, 13. No, mate, guys, that's perfect. Qualifications? qualifications? Did it? Uh, I'd, I'd, yeah, did it in the army, yeah. Can't yeah. say fairer than that. So there it is, Kira. But obviously, I, 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 do not try this. Uh, no one, ever. Silly. No, absolutely not. Okay, thank you. Half past 12 is the time. Amelia Cox has the headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 12.34. This from Gravel. How do you manage to, on Blue Sky, which is where I um, go now for my social media interactions, how do you manage to produce such riveting radio, James? I can't believe I was on tenterhooks waiting for a soft toy mm, to say simples. Well, Keith's done something to the clip. 
now. And apparently, when I play this one, the second version of it, everyone will hear simples. So the, the, this is the one that is definitely saying simples. Right, everyone be quiet. Ready? <coughs> no, it didn't work. It still heard haggis. I was trying to do psychology on you. I was trying to make simples. Let's try once more. Simple, simples, simple, simples, 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 simples. <coughs> Ah, this is driving me nuts. Uh, someone explain it. Mike's in Peterly. Question or answer, Mike? It's an answer, James. Carry on. Simple to me a cat. I didn't think I'd ever say that out loud. But... There it is. Go on, tell me. <laughs> tell me. <laughs> Quickly, help me. Basically, if I tell you that you're hearing something, yeah. you will hear it. And this is uh, has been proven in court in the US. Gosh. So what happened is in the 1980s, mid-1980s, there was an organisation run by Al Gore's wife called the PMRC, the Parents Music Resource Centre, which led to parental advisory stickers on albums. Tipper Gore, she was called. Yes, Tipper Gore. Yeah, Um, She's not popular in the metal community, to say the least. And she came up with a list of... Uh, songs that should be banned called the Filthy Thirteen, and that <laughs> so want to be on that, wouldn't you? <laughs> oh, it, it's some of the best music in the world. Don't I mean, go even, there. It's even off-com, went after off-com, John Denver. Off- yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, and um, so on the back of that, um, the heavy metal band Judas Priest were subject to um, a civil prosecution for a belief manslaughter because the oh. kids were handing the records, records backwards looking for messages. Right. And the prosecution hinged on the fact that the lyric, when you wound it backward, sounded like do it. Okay. And the defence was, um, basically the band said... Um, Pick any song randomly, we'll wind it backwards and tell you what it says. Uh, and they won the case because they said, well, that sounds like Get Me a Peppermint. Yeah. And it did. So the case completely fell through. There was another case against Ozzy Osbourne, but that's slightly, um, th- th- that's slightly less defensive because it was called Suicide Solutions. So, but, but, the, but it has been proven in court that if I suggest that this sounds like this, then you're going to hear it because I didn't hear um, Haggis until you said it. And the, so I shouldn't... So, so, so everyone... I, but then I tried to redo it a minute ago just before you came on. I think you heard when yeah. I, I just tried to get the word simples in everyone's head, but it's too late by then. It's too late. They've already heard Haggis. And that's what they're going to hear <laughs> forevermore. And, what a and brilliant that is literally answer. all it is. Yeah. What a brilliant answer. There's crossover oh, here you. as well, isn't there? Because you, you mentioned Ozzy Osbourne, the, the, the uh, Judas Priest from Birmingham as well. And, and uh, mm-hmm. d- d- wasn't there one member that played with Black Sabbath? Or am I going nuts now? Wasn't there one cross? Mm, no, no. You're, um, oh, oh, God, the people who've been in and out of Black Sabbath since yeah, Ozzy. That, yeah, uh, that's I why mean, you need Rock Family Trees, isn't it? To remember. the, the good, Yeah. They were called Earth. I think at the at, before they were yes called, they like, were and they were um, jazz rock when they were called Earth and then they were called Polka Talk. You know your stuff, don't you? Uh, I do. Best gig you've ever been to? <laughs> Maiden every time. Is it really all day long? No, without a doubt. Last time I saw him, they had a life size Spitfire on stage for the opening track, and he, well, it just got have, better he, from he there. Have, he could have flown it in himself, couldn't he? <laughs> Got the you won't get a 747 on stage at all. <laughs> oh, I love it. Uh, qualifications? I'm a music nerd and a 50 year old musician who's been playing since his teens. Fantastic. And I just love a bit of rock and roll. And you've smashed that one very unexpectedly with that qualification. You've smashed the meerkat question out of the park. Beautifully done, Mike. Thank you. I'll still get applause. You know you do. Oh, brilliant. Look at that. Over the moon. Thank you. I, it's extraordinary that. And, and it is just literally your mind telling you what you're going to hear and then you hear it so uh, an interesting experiment will is in milton Keynes. will question or answer question jane carry on will so i've been playing golf since i was seven oh, and yes. also been on tour around the world yes so, as, as a golf enough, yeah okay so i came up with this listening to your podcast when i was training abroad mm. and I've not looked it up since, and I probably should know this really, given how long I played a game for. The scoring system in golf. Yes. Birdies, eagles, albatross, bogeys. I, obviously, par's slightly different because that's just dead down the middle. Yes. 
But where did that come from? It's a very odd naming system for anything. Obviously, I can kind of get the birds, then eagles and albatross. But who came up with that? I just wonder if it's come from something in the 1800s or it's something. It's a lovely question. I've got a feeling, because I think I've got a feeling that it came up. I think it's in the board game, which means we've done it. I've, I've just got a vague memory of it coming up last Christmas when we were playing the board game. And someone made up a very brilliant wrong answer that I incorrectly chose because the board game's a bit like call my bluff you, you, you have to come up with wrong answers there's one wrong answer on the board and then you as a player come up with your own wrong answer in the hope that it will be such a convincing wrong answer that other players will choose your wrong answer instead of the right answer and i've just got half a memory about someone coming up with a brilliant answer as to why golf nomenclature in, it, it was so ornithological um but i can't remember it so it's on the board we, 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 we like that a lot i mean it's a weird one isn't it no, I, I asked. I asked my coach, and yes. he had no clue. And he's been playing the game, God knows how long. So that's not <laughs> very nice. It long. You go, it's not a very nice way to speak about your elders. <laughs> oh no, no, he, no. To be fair, he's um, he's about five years older than me, but oh, okay. uh, he's, you're he's, on. Yeah, like, are, are you good? I mean, are you, are you, are you, are you? Are you, are you do you make a living you're a pro i think aren't you if you're going on tour yeah it's it's tough it, yeah, it it's one of I those where without sponsorship you're you're really you're really pushed especially at the lower levels the price sure. money's not insane but then obviously the carrot is what's on the horizon yeah, what's at the horizon exactly. like a like a you know mystery our board game or something like that for the best contribution of the week I, who knows just dare to dream will dare to dream yes i will do it is 12 41 i like that question uh, and I, I, I can't wait to hear out what the answer is someone must know that oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number that you need andy is in lambourne andy question or answer question please james carry on mate right uh Last week, I was unpacking the home delivery, which my wife had kindly ordered. Oh, yes. And to, to earn brainy points, I'm unpacking and putting it all away. But one thing I noticed was with the vinegar, she'd ordered white vinegar, distilled white vinegar and brown vinegar. Yes. They're both preservatives, aren't they? Yes. Yeah? Yes. They've got use by dates on them. What's that all about? <sighs> what, what, what vessels were they in? What were they in? Um, they're in glass bottles. So I, I mean, you get used to buy dates on water in glass bottles, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I can understand. But yeah, the water, it, it can. Get I can't. You can't. I mean, through, vinegar does go off, actually. Does it? Well, you get you you get a really old bottle of vinegar out the back of your your nan's cupboard, and it's yep. gone all it's gone all cloudy. It's got lots of sediment in it. Oh, I've never seen that. Well, because you, you've always used it. That's why she has to buy so much. You get through it at a rate of knots in your house, obviously. Do you eat a lot of chips? Uh, no, I'm not allowed chips. I have to go to Cyprus to get chips. What? <laughs> Cyprus? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Is, is that the name of the chippy in Lambourne, or is that an island in the Mediterranean? No, no, it's a, the island in the Mediterranean. <laughs> chips are not allowed in our household, so I have, only time I get chips is when I'm abroad. When you're on but, holiday. All right, I didn't want yeah. to open up a marital... What are you using all the vinegar on? Um, different uses, pickling, but white vinegar is really, it goes in the washing machine every wash ah. because it's hard water in our area. Obviously. Okay. What do you pickle? Um, me normally. <laughs> no, sorry, that's the beer, isn't it? That's the cider question. Well, seriously, yeah, well, I mean, do you, do you do a lot of pickling? Uh, not a lot. No. Not a lot. No. Right. no. Onions sometimes. I love, I love if I've got lots of them. I like that. Um, I'll try and find, I think, I think I've seen off vinegar which kind of answers your question but i know what you mean if it's a preservative yeah. how come it can't preserve itself forever exactly it exactly yes. um I, ollie's been in touch he says can't believe you go all the way to cyprus to get chips my mum goes to iceland <laughs> Twelve forty-three is the time well, there's a, there was a, a a chippy in um chalton come hardy when i was a kid not a kid i was like a, my year between school and university when i lived there for a while and it, 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 there were two there was a chinese takeaway and there was a, a fish and chip shop that also did Chinese food. And if you went into the one that was not a fish and chip shop and asked for chips, the lady behind the counter would say, if you want chips, you have to go to Hong Kong. And there were points in the evening where we found this the funniest thing we'd ever heard. Because, of course, the other takeaway about 100 yards up the road was called Hong Kong. So we go, what, well, really? Oh, students are terrible, aren't they? You have all the way to Hong Kong just to get some chips. So, oh, Cyprus is closer. Nathan's in Portsmouth. Nathan, question or answer? 
It's a question, James. Carry it's on. another kind of food-based question. Marvelous. So about six or seven weeks ago, me and Lisa, my missus, were on holiday in Egypt. Oh, lovely. And there I am queuing up for my omelette for breakfast in the morning, and yes. there's about half a dozen chefs yes. with those funny hats on. Yes. They're made of paper, and they're about two foot high, usually. Yes, yes. Now, some of the chefs had them on, some didn't. Mm. And I thought, where have those hats come from? Why are they made of paper? Some are cloth but mainly their paper, and why are they two for eye with like a sort of pie crust top on it? And wherever you go in the world, doesn't matter whether it's here in the UK, the middle of Egypt, France, wherever, they all wear the same type of hat. I don't think, that's, I don't think that last bit's true, Nathan. Your yeah, question still everywhere. stands, but I think that you would have probably, in the Middle East... And 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 the subcontinent. I think, unless you were in a restaurant frequented by Westerners, I very much doubt they'd be wearing the hats you describe. Mm. I think it but was. But there's enough different. There is definite. No, no, there is. Do, it, you do it, wear them. Is there a code? Is what we're. Is there a chef's hat code? A code of chapeau well, de you chef. Get, I wondered if oh. it was. You know, because you have different sort of. Layers of chef, don't you? So you have the you have the sous chef, you have a senior sous chef, Com- you have the chef, chef de party, pastry chef, chef, chef de party. So I wondered if there was a hierarchy that would wear different hats. But the real question, I suppose, is where did that hat come from? Why is it two foot? Well, it's obviously very tall. It's got the kind of lid on the top. I thought it might have done to the classic, you know, the classic, maybe, but the classic yeah, of the, the classic chef's, hat, hat. the chef's hat. Where did, yeah, where, why? Why? I mean, what is the point of it? Because really, you, you only really need a hairnet for hygiene reasons. Yeah. Is it so you can see the chef over all the shelves in the kitchen? <laughs> I'm, not, yeah, I'm not joking. Like that. That's just a good thinking, well, that, isn't it? So you yeah, know where he maybe. is? Over there? He rises above all the smoke and the steam. You can see like a lighthouse, the chef's hat. Easy to throw stuff at, maybe, you know, that. across the kitchen. I don't know the answer to this. I think, mm. I think it's called a TOC. Okay. T-O-C-Q-U-E. I, well, at least I've been sent that word without any context by about five different people, so I'm presuming that's why. Um, a lot of the rat- evolution t- of it? That's basically well, yeah, it. Well, why why do chefs end up with TOCs? Top. Why do they end up with yeah. TOCs? Um, a lot of Ratatouille fans getting in touch. You can <laughs> guess what they're saying. That's, that's where you keep your rat. But I will find out for you. What, what, what is the origin, the evolution, the, the, the kind of um, the backstory, the origin story of the chef's hat, or the talk, as I believe it is called. Nathan, thank you. did you like Egypt, Nathan? I've never been. It was wonderful. Was Hagada. it? We went brilliant. Where? Red Sea Coast. Trim- Hagada. Hagada. Mm, Hagada. Really brilliant. Lovely. Well, well, that's good. Good recommendation there. Um, I'll put it under Purbeck on my list of places to visit. 12.47 is the time. James O'Brien on LBC. <laughs> It's 10 to 1, and uh, just a special mention to everybody who's joining us over on Blue Sky, the, the social media um, platform that appears to be at least filling some of the space that has been um, polluted by... I think even Keith's on there, if you look carefully, so you can you can find Keith on there. Lots lots more of us moving over there, so um, uh, be aware. I, I have the same handle on there that I had on the other place, Mr. James O.B., if you are interested. Uh, back to Mr. I'm going to just add this. This is just for Kira. I don't normally take texts on uh, Mr. Air, as you know, but Wesley's been in touch to tell us I am a base jumper, and I have, here you go, Kira, I have literally jumped out of windows in buildings. I've jumped from as low as 122 feet. I've jumped from bridges, cranes, casinos, etc. Et casino stands out a bit in that sentence, doesn't it? I mean, buildings, bridges, cranes, casinos. Um, that's probably a way to identify you. It's possible via different methods and different types of pilot shoot, James, to extract the canopy quicker the lower you jump. So, yes, categorically. How does he know, Kira? Because he's done it. That's a great answer. Uh, Verena is in Leytonstone. Verena, question or answer? Uh, answer, James. Carry on, Verena. Or at least a partial answer, because oh, yes. I am living, living proof that you can forget how to swim. What happened? Um, well, at primary age, I was able to swim after taking lessons at school, yeah. a length, up to a length. Okay. I was able to do that routinely. But then for decades after that, I've never had any occasion to swim. Why not? Hmm, when do you need to swim? Do you not <laughs> go, when you're on holiday, do you not go to the seaside? No, or no, nothing no, like that? no, okay. no. Never came up raising children, that type of thing. Didn't yeah, get a chance I, to I, do that. I hear you. I hear you. Go on. And then um, I've always wanted to learn to swim because I know as I've got older, 
it's a great all-round exercise yes, to be able is. to do yeah. and could save my life one day. Low impact as well. You don't get, it doesn't yep. do your knees in like almost everything else does. Yep. Taken lessons. I just, I know what to do, yeah. but I cannot do it. I cannot coordinate. I cannot swim. So how far, I mean, were you quite bad as a child? Not, I mean, you say you could do a length. Would you, I mean, were you swimming like a, like, like a sort of doggy paddle? No, no, I was able to do proper crawl. Really? Yes. But now you get in the pool and you can't do anything at all. Yeah, well, as I say, I know what to do. Well, you obviously but, don't, um, madam. <laughs> well, I know what to do on paper. Oh, we all know. Yeah, but what? I mean, how how many lessons have you had? Oh, I, I um, enrolled at the local uh, pool and I did a year's worth of lessons once what? a week. And they tell you that you you know you need to do additional time to yeah. practice on your own. So I would do a half an extra half an hour a week. I just cannot coordinate it. I cannot. After an hour, you st- after a year, you couldn't swim. You still couldn't swim. That's right. At all, at all, at all. No, I swim like a brick. <laughs> and you could definitely swim as a child. Oh yes. Have you could, checked um, with other people? You've not got some false memory syndrome going on here. No, but I don't know any people that I went to primary school with anymore. So uh, oh, it's poignant. No. Um. Well, yeah, I mean, you get a round of applause. I mean, do you get a Ray Liotta? I don't, I have well, any... I, well, I don't know the neurological or the scientific reason why I can't do it. No. So it's only really a half answer, I think. Uh, no, no, it's not. Don't do yourself down. Gareth was pretty clear. He just wanted to know whether it was possible. You are living non-swimming proof. <laughs> okay, thank you. Did you see that? Instead of living walking proof, I said living non-swimming proof, that, that it is possible to forget how to swim. Yep, I'm with you. Round of applause for for, for <laughs> Thank you, Ray Liotta, but just in case there's thousands of people who, who, who've forgotten how to swim. I don't know. Well, you live and learn, eh? Thank you, Verena. Uh, Shlomi is in Manchester. Shlomi, question or answer? Answer. Carry on. Swimming one. Oh. Um, so maybe a bit more of a scientific explanation to why w- the period... Wouldn't be hard. Answer. Wouldn't be hard, Shlomi, would it, if we're <laughs> honest? Bless her. Go on. So, yeah, you can learn to forget, uh, you can forget to, um, something you have learnt, um, although something of a skill that you mastered really, really well, and that's gone into your, what would your long term memories, what would it be akin to a long term memory, um, would be harder to forget. Um, um, but again, uh, if you've not used that over a long time. And, and she hadn't done it that much, so she probably had weekly lessons at primary school. Yeah. She got the hang of it, she did a length, she, t- she left primary school, she never swam again, so she hadn't done it enough to kind of imprint it on the long term memory. Yeah, definitely wasn't, probably not a skill that she'd fully, fully mastered. Um, it's not a great phone time. line, Shlomi, so I haven't got long. Um, is there a name for it, or is it just called forgetting? <laughs> People call it muscle memory. Um, yeah, but that, also, I thought right. I um, I said that. Yeah, and also when people have um, neurological um, damage to, so say, after a stroke, if it affects that area of the brain, then they also lose muscle function. Well, it, yeah, if uh, you can come back from brain yeah. trauma with a different accent from the one that you had before you went into it, you can almost certainly come back not, not remembering how to swim, even though you could swim before. Yeah, people come out of strokes and forget how to walk, forget how to yeah, talk, forget how to do all sorts of motor function. Qualifications? Um, so yeah, that's the answer. Occupational therapist. Round of applause for Shlomi, the occupational therapist. That's one of the very few scoops of my career involved George Michael coming out of, uh, of, of some sort of minor coma and speaking in a broad Dorset accent. And uh, he told me that live on the radio, and, uh, and he'd never told anyone else before. Of course, in the next day's newspapers, they'd never mentioned where they'd heard it. It was just George Michael said yesterday. Or, uh, but that was probably one of the only showbiz scoops of my life. I certainly didn't get any when I was a showbiz journalist. Brian's in Loughborough. Brian, question or answer? Hi, James. Lovely show. Thank um, you, Brian. This is, not, this is an answer to the um, uh, orchards question. Lovely. Um, yes, um, they do diminish in yield and quality, but obviously there's a trade-off. If you replant uh, an orchard, it's going to take quite a few years for the trees to get back up to full size. Yes. And, um, but there are, might be other reasons you do it. Taste change, obviously, and you might re-space the trees to allow for things like mechanical harvesters. So there's lots of variables where you might choose to redesign an orchard. It, 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 oh, and is there a, a point at which you'd give up and say, oh, there's no point sticking with this tree, we're going to have to start again? I mean, is there a sort of natural expiry well, date? Uh, I'm not sure of the specifics on that one, I'm afraid. Okay. I'm not Qualifications? Really no. My best mate, Joey Hughes, is an orchard consultant. That's, that's his job, orchards. Orchard consultant. Yeah, he, he literally goes around designing orchards. He's based in Mid Wales. He goes all over the place. Yeah. Nice job, isn't it? 
Yeah, he's doing his, yeah, he's, he's like living the dream, literally, yeah. How does he like them apples? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I thought that was good. No? no. Oh, come on, no one else is. Someone's going to have, all right. Uh, a round of applause for Brian, please. Thanks, James. Thank you, Brian. Sorry, everyone. Pratap's in Islington. Pratap, question or answer? Hi, James. It's an answer for the vinegar question. Oh, excellent. Carry on. Uh, And uh, so technically, uh, vinegar won't actually go off, uh, but if it is a live vinegar, like a live apple cider vinegar, then it can over-oxidize. So what that means is once uh, the bacteria is finished converting the alcohol in the cider into um, acetic acid, it will then start converting the vinegar into water and carbon dioxide Uh if it is not stored properly. So then... Uh, the acetic acid content would obviously d- dilute down, so then it is no longer viable for preservation or the vinegar. It's it more watery, doesn't it? Uh, d- yes. D- d- technique. Uh, and is that only on live vinegars? Only on like an apple cider? That happens that... on live vinegars. It wouldn't happen to a normal vinegar, malt it... vinegar or a white vinegar or anything like that. So with those, um, again, the oxidization will can remove a lot of the uh, the, the flavour aromas and molecules that oh, contribute to the majority this of the flavour. Vin- another vintage mystery. We keep doing it. Qualifications, Pratap. Vinegar maker. What? <laughs> I make vinegar. What? Just I mean, like, not, 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 not commercially. I oh. make I make a lot of vinegar um, just for my own use in my in my business. I'm what? also a member of the Fermenters Guild. But, oh, she, why are you coming on at twelve fifty eight when Sheila's already doing her stretches in the corner of the studio? <laughs> what do you mean that you make? What do you what do you use it for? All this vinegar that you make. Oh, uh, in my cooking, because I mean, I'm, I'm a chef and um, I, oh. have a, I, I have my own business. So yeah, I use all my vinegars. At the moment, I've got a mango scrap vinegar, passion fruit vinegar. Mm. I've even made a vinegar from uh, Jägermeister. A Jägermeister vinegar? Yes. Keith's ears pricked up. What, um... <laughs> Sorry. And, and you'd use it mostly on salads, would you? Or... Salad and to cook with as well. Where do you uh, cook? Salad, Where's your cook- restaurant? Um, I do private dining and sort of pop-ups and supper clubs in London. I, I, pop, pop-ups. I, I, I just, I, I'm so hungry now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a Rayliota. You make your own vinegar. I mean, how common? How many people are in the Fermenters Guild? Uh, there are about two hundred yeah, plus. Oh, this is Rayliota. Come off it. it oh my god! And Thank also, you, so but much. you said it so casually as well. That got you over the line. I make my own vinegar. Like everyone does. It's like it, <laughs> my own a oh, passion fruit vinegar. What a moment for all of us. I'm Ray Liotta, and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. <laughs> if you build it, they will come. Look at that. I think the game goes to Perbeck Sam, doesn't it? Perbeck, Cider Sam in Perbeck, I think. I, I, so he gets the game this week. That's it for another week. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, where you can also pause and rewind live radio, as well as listen to a range of podcasts. Download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick. But now it's Sheila Fogarty. James O'Brien on LBC.